As a member of the organizing committee, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to the Europe and Central, Central Europe and Colonialism Seminar. This is the fourth in a series of humanities seminars we're organizing as a philological faculty of the University of Wroclaw and Academia Europea Knowledge Hub. The themes of the previous seminars were Central European print culture, regimes of memory in Central Europe, and literary margins and digital media. All seminars are co-hosted by the Faculty of Philology of the University of Wroclaw and Academia Europea Knowledge Hub in Wroclaw. Both institutions here are represented by the executives, the faculty by Dean Marcin Czinski, and the knowledge hub by Professor Tadeusz Buter. First, you will be addressed by Professor Czinski. Professor Czinski is a specialist in 18th century Polish literature, and I must say he has been very helpful in preparing this uh, seminar. Good morning. Proszę Państwa, jesteśmy we dwóch z Panem prodziekanem, profesorem Berezowskim, ponieważ dwugłowy smok w takich sytuacjach jest zawsze lepszy niż jednogłowy. <laughs> There are two of us in this situation, uh, me and the uh, associate dean uh, speaking to you right now, because a two-headed dragon in such situation is much better than a single-headed dragon. Proszę Państwa, będę mówił po polsku, ponieważ Państwo odbywacie konferencję po angielsku. I will speak in Polish because you are holding your conference in English. I w ten sposób macie Państwo okazję usłyszeć polski język we Wrocławiu. So you will get a chance to listen to Polish in Wrocław a bit at least. Proszę Państwa, witam Państwa więc we Wrocławiu, chociaż to lepiej zrobi Pan Profesor Luty. I would like to welcome you in Wrocław, even though Professor Luty will do it much better. Witam Państwa na Uniwersytecie Wrocławskim, na Wydziale Filologicznym i w murach zawsze gościnnego Instytutu Filologii Romańskiej. I would like to welcome you uh, in, uh, in the premises of Wrocław University, of the Faculty of Letters or Faculty of Philology, whichever name we use, and more specifically in, in the building which houses the Romans Languages and Literatures Department. Na Wydziale Filologicznym mówimy tak mniej więcej w 40 językach. In this faculty we speak in around 40 languages. Więc nie jest dla nas, powiedziałbym, niczym zaskakującym gościć uczonych z całego świata. So holding a conference with participants from all over the world is nothing surprising for us. Ale goszczenie Państwa jest dla nas zaszczytem i przyjemnością szczególną. But it's a special privilege to have you here today. Państwo wnosicie perspektywę rzeczywiście europejską, interdyscyplinarną, porównawczą, wielojęzyczną. Because what you bring here is an international, comparative and interdisciplinary perspective on research. I temat Państwa seminarium jest powiedziałbym szczególnie ważny. And the topic of your seminar is particularly important. Historia badań nad kolonializmem czy nad postkolonializmem w Polsce jest y, krótka i dziwna. Because the history of colonialism and postcolonialism studies in Poland is short and weird. Y, jestem wrocławianinem z urodzenia i przypominam sobie, I, I, am, I have been born in Wrocław and I do remember, że w czasach mojego dzieciństwa mówiło się o kolonistach, o kolonializmie, o skolonializowaniu Wrocławia. And when I was a child, I do remember that what was spoken about when the, uh, was colonizing Wrocław. Chodziło o migrację po II wojnie światowej. And what people were talking about was the migration following World War II. To było zupełnie przypadkowe i propagandowe używanie tego, tego słowa, tego terminu. That was a purely accidental and propagandic Uh, use of that word. Bo w badaniach naukowych, kiedy jeszcze jakiś czas temu ktoś podejmował próbę mówienia o kolonializmie, because in research, even quite recently, when people try to talk about colonialism, pojawiało się zdanie, ale przecież Polska nigdy nie miała żadnych kolonii, to jakieś nieporozumienie. The response always was, but Poland has never had any colonies, and that's why talking about such topics is a misunderstanding. 
pojawiało się co prawda takie topiczne wspomnienie właśnie osiemnastowieczne. Uh, there was a reminiscence going back to the 18th century occasionally. Historia awanturnika, powstańca bardzo barwnej postaci. The story of a Polish uprising leader and, a, and, and an adventurer who uh, went wild out far away from here. Maurycego Augusta Beniowskiego, który zesłany na Syberię, wydostał się stamtąd. His name was Maurice August Beniowski. He was ex exiled to Siberia for participating in Polish uprisings and he got free from out there and... I został, no, nieformalnym, ale władcą Madagaskaru. And kind of informally, he became the ruler of Madagascar. I jedyny punkt zaczepienia wskazywano nam, że oto ta historia Beniowskiego, to tę kolonię możemy badać. So if colonialism came up as a topic, that was always the answer. Uh, Madagascar is the place we potentially could research because we have a link with, it, with that place. <laughs> Ale tak naprawdę najczęstszym jeszcze niedawno punktem odniesienia zaczepienia. Uh, but um, sort of more seriously, the real reference point in, in that context until quite recently. Był wierszyk, który czytano w szkołach, właśnie przed chwilą sobie to przypomnieliśmy. Was a short poem which was read in the first class of the primary school. Wiersz napisany przez polskiego wybitnego poetę Juliana Tuwima jeszcze w latach 30. The poem was written back in the 1930s by, by an eminent Polish poet Julian Tuwim. Wierszyk nazywał się Murzynek Bambo. The title was Bambo the Black. I trochę z niego jeszcze pamiętamy. Ten and, wiersz brzmiał mniej więcej tak. And we, we still do remember at least a bit about the poem. Uh, the dean will recite parts and I hope I'll manage. Murzynek Bambo w Afryce mieszka. Czarną ma skórę ten nasz koleżka. Uczy się pilnie wieczory i ranki ze swej murzyńskiej pierwszej czytanki. Bambo the black lives in Africa, has a black skin and every night and day he learns from his black reading, first reading book. This is how it opens. <laughs> Pojawiały się też takie elementy, że Bambo y, boi się umyć, bo zmieni kolor skóry i... Later on there is a specific reference to washing where the poet said Bambo is afraid to wash because his black may wash off. I nikt nie zauważał nacechowania tego wiersza właśnie elementami kolonialnymi, taką no, dziwną właśnie perspektywą. And for decades nobody noticed this kind of a loaded colonial perspective on the, of this poem and it, it, it went simply uh, unnoticed for decades. I właśnie od analiz tego wierszyka, od analiz tego, jak na przykład Sienkiewicz widział Amerykę, zaczął się nurt badań kolonialnych, postkolonialnych w Polsce. And studying colonialism and postcolonialism in Poland started with analyzing that poem, realizing what it really represents and then going back to uh, the writings of an eminent Polish uh, writer Uh, Sienkiewicz, who went to uh, America in the 19th century and also wrote letters back home, and this was also a source of early colonial analysis. A dzisiaj, wychodząc na spotkanie z Państwem, sięgnąłem, no nie całkiem na chybił trafił na półkę z książkami. Uh, and preparing to leave home to uh, come to this beautiful place today, I reached out to my bookshelf, more or less at random. I postanowiłem Państwu pokazać książkę, która się nazywa po pierwsze jest gruba, a po drugie nazywa się Polska Szecherezada, swoje i obce z perspektywy postkolonialnej. And uh, I would like to show you this book. It's kind of, as you can see, quite a big tome, but the title is uh, The Polish Scheherazade, uh, Native and Foreign Perspectives on Postcolonialism. Proszę Państwa, to jest oczywiście tylko jedno ze świadectw tego, jak ewoluuje nasz, mówię, w Polsce sposób myślenia o tych zagadnieniach, którymi Państwo się zajmujecie. It's only one example which shows you how uh, what you are doing uh, here and what you do on a regular basis in research is evolving in Poland right now. I dlatego, tak jak mówiłem przed chwilą, mówimy na wydziale różnymi językami. And that's why, as I said in the beginning, in this faculty we speak in various languages. Ale bardzo jest dla nas ważne, żebyśmy mówili też o sprawach poważnych, o sprawach serio, o sprawach, które odkrywamy dzięki współpracy naukowej. But it's not only learning languages, what is very important is that we use them to speak about serious important issues like these ones that you will be discussing here. Więc życzę Państwu 
dobrego, efektywnego dzielenia się swoimi poglądami, wynikami badań, bardzo dobrych rozmów. So I do hope that you will have a nice conference where you will share your thoughts, your ideas and your papers fruitfully with all participants. I mam nadzieję, że organizatorzy mi wybaczą. And I hope the organizers uh, will not hold any grudge against me. Życzę Państwu też chwil przechadzki po Wrocławiu, może niekoniecznie w czasie referatów, ale żeby to się połączyło jedno z drugim odpowiednio. But I do encourage you to take walks around the city, maybe not during your own paper, maybe uh, on some other occasions, but it's really worthwhile. Wszystkiego najlepszego, udanych obrad i dobrego pobytu we Wrocławiu. Bardzo dziękuję. The next speaker is Professor Lutte. Professor Tadej Lutte is a professor of chemistry and a former rector of the Wroclaw University of Technology. And he is now the director of the Academia Europea Knowledge Hub in Wroclaw. A to powinno być na wierzchu. Dzień dobry Państwu. Good morning. <coughs> Uh, I will start with a uh, remark that because you have been exposed to the beauty of Polish language, I think it's time to listen to the, uh, let me say, poor English. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, I will try. Uh, thank you, Professor Hoyhen, for the introduction. And uh, yes, I have a pleasure to serve as the academic director of the Academia Europea Knowledge Hub. The Knowledge Hub uh, in Wrocław has been established as the first knowledge hub in Europe. And uh, nowadays, uh, the Academia Europea has actually four knowledge hubs, and you may soon find uh, activity of the Knowledge Hub in Barcelona and in Cardiff and in Bergen in Norway. We are lucky that uh, Academia Europea, the prestigious uh, institution, has decided to establish this hub in our city. It was always an ambition of the uh, academic community to have such uh, institution which will uh, underline not only our activity but also an aspiration. As uh, most of you know, the Wrocław is I think not only by our wish, but in fact, it's an academic city. Uh, we have uh, approximately 150,000 students, if the number of students is a measure of the uh, academics. Uh, but uh, much more important, we have a rather prestigious and uh, very active uh, institution. Here, which are mostly universities, but there are also two uh, leading institutes of Polish Academy of Sciences, and we have to remember this. Also, you may know, and if you don't yet visit the Ossolineum, which is an uh, absolutely unusual institution, and uh, uh, it's actually based on foundation, and the history of this institution will be, for most of you, surely a, a, a kind of story. The dean has said uh, that uh, I will probably invite you better for the uh, beauty of our city. And, uh, and it is, uh, in fact, also to some extent my, my obligation because I self as the advisor to the mayor of the city of Wrocław, and this year 
It's a particular year in Wrocław because Wrocław is a, is a capital of culture, European capital of culture. And there are a lot of activities. Uh, and again, I will, uh, I will join Professor Tinsky with the advice to go around and, and see and use this uh, opportunity. Not necessarily, as he said, during your lectures. But uh, the activity of the seminar will probably keep you busy here. Nevertheless, let's make one day more to stay in Warsaw. Um, seminars, which uh, unfortunately, this seminar is the last from the series. The seminars have been uh, invented or initiated by Professor Hoyken and Professor Emmer. And uh, I have a pleasure on behalf of Academia Europea uh, to thank you both, and in Professor Hoyken in particular, for this uh, inspiration. And it has been, I think, uh, as I remember, uh, five or six years ago when you ever wrote a project about uh, this cycle of seminars, four seminars, and the project has been sent to our sponsor, uh, Rexbanken's Jubileums Fund. It's a Swedish foundation which is generous for this kind of activities, and I think we all we own them a lot of thanks for this support. Uh, but, uh, of course, uh, money is uh, important for such events, but not the most important. The most important is an activity, and for this uh, activity I thank to my colleagues from the university, especially dean of the faculty, and, uh, of course, also the uh, director of the Institute of uh, where we are, uh, let me uh, read uh, uh, Professor Beata Baczynska. She's not with us, but please pass my thanks on behalf of Academia Europea for her hospitality for the seminars for members and so on. The Academia Europea Hub is extremely grateful to the colleagues from universities for the success of these four seminars and uh, the most uh, uh, wonderful <laughs> gift which you can live here for, and in particular for the academic hub would be a yeah, nice memory from the activity during the seminars and publications which I suppose will be a fruit of your meeting. I wish you very active discussions. All of you who meet for the second and more time, just to refresh your friendship and uh, take home good memory from Wrocław and from the university in particular. Before we start with our proceedings, I would like to make a few comments about the theme of our seminar. My first comment concerns the notion of Central Europe. Central Europe as a geographic concept is not clearly defined. Since its coinage as a geopolitical concept in the early 20th century Germany, more or less every part of Europe has been included into Central Europe or Middle Europa, except for the Iberian Peninsula. Historically, there is a good argument to be made to speak of Central Europe as a separate region from the late Middle Ages until the end of World War II, in the sense of a German sphere of influence resulting from migration, economic development, and military expansion. Before 1800, German had become the chief language of civil society in Bohemia and Hungary, among others. Even Wuch, a part of Russian Poland, at the large German-speaking community at the end of the 19th century. 
and German was also often the language of choice of educated Jews. In the 1940s, the 1940s brought a turning point. The murder of the Jewish population, the westward shift of Poland, the expulsion of Germans changed the cultural and political landscape of Central Europe. Furthermore, the Federal Republic of Germany, the most substantial part of the divided Germany, became part of the West during the Cold War. For the first time in history, Russia established itself as the predominant Central European power. And with the Iron Curtain, the East-West division of Europe was established. Debates about Central Europe re-emerged in the 1980s with a retrospective focus on the polyglot urban culture of the pre-1918 Habsburg monarchy. In this debate, Jews rather than healthy peasants were the common theme. An important participant in this debate was the Czech novelist Milan Kundera. In an article in the New York Review of Books, Kundera excluded both Germany and Russia from Central Europe. Russia would not even be a part of Europe at all, according to Kundera. While European culture had been replaced by consumer culture in Western Europe, the real cultural heritage of Europe was still flourishing in its heart, according to Kundera. Since the end of the Cold War, yet the idea of Central Europe remained an important rhetorical device for Poles, Czechs, Hungarians, and others to distance themselves from an orientalized Eastern Europe. In line with Kundera's reasoning, this Central Europe had to be more confined than the German idea of Middle Europa. In the phrase of the Hungarian novelist and dissident, Georgi Konrad, this Central Europe was made up of small nations between two large ones, Germany and Russia. Of course, we will not include Poland in these small nations. In our discussions, we need to keep in mind that some participants prefer a narrow uh, de delineation according to which Central Europe is limited to nations between Germany and Russia, while others, those working on the earlier periods, prefer to include Germany and Switzerland even as well. My second comment concerns the interdisciplinary nature of the seminar. We have both literary scholars and historians participating. Most of the literary scholars, and Professor Chinsky already hinted in that, that direction, tend to be influenced by post-colonial theory. The historians to a lesser degree, or not at, not at all, and this might cause misunderstandings. In post-colonial theory, imperial power is not so much regarded as a material phenomenon and more as an epistemological system, reconstructed on the basis of discursive texts, most often printed texts. Archival documents only play a subsidiary role. According to the American historian Dane Kennedy, for many historians, and I quote, the advent of post-colonial studies with its strange language and theoretical promiscuity appeared akin to an invasion of a barbarian horde, end of quote. Kennedy's observation is valid for the attitudes of historians during the 90s, since the so-called new imperial history of the British Empire has taken up many of the topics which were broached by post-colonial theory. Gender, identity, race, imperial networks, imaginary, geographies and colonial discourses have become familiar elements in discussions of imperial history, at least in the Anglophone world. What might be unfamiliar to some Western participants of our seminar, also something Professor Chinsky hinted at, is the application of post-colonial theory to the analysis of culture and history of Central Europe. When I conceived the idea of this seminar some time ago, I was thinking in the first place of the involvement of people from Central Europe in colonial territories outside Europe. I was thinking, for instance, of our poster boy, Bronislav Malinowski. Of course, you recognized him. Not a chat from the right or the left. <laughs> Malinowski was born and raised as an ethnic Pole in Krakow, then part of the Habsburg monarchy, 
and he invented the British School of Social Anthropology during World War I in British New Guinea. Malinowski's identity as an Austro-Hungarian Pole played an important role in this process because British authorities regarded him as an enemy citizen, Austro-Hungarian, and possibly a German spy. He could not travel freely in New Guinea and was confined to stay put in one place for longer periods. This circumstance played a role in developing participant observation, the standard method <laughs> of field research of anthropologists since. According to Ernest Gellner, maybe also known to you, uh, by origin in Czech, by the way, Malinowski's background as an Austro-Hungarian Pole was also essential at a more theoretical level. Malinowski took a holistic approach to culture from Polish ethnography and implied, applied it to the Trobriands, the inhabitants of the Trobriand Isles. But instead of seeking largely imaginary historical explanations of current practices as the Polish ethnographers had been doing when they described peasant communities in the Carpathians, Malinowski developed a rigorous, non-historical, empirical, functionalist approach to culture, an approach which he took from the Viennese philosopher Ernst Mach, the topic of his uh, Krakow dissertation, by the way. If he would have left the idea for the seminar at that, Central Europeans and overseas colonies, commodities from overseas colonies coming to Central Europe, quite a number of you would not have been here. Thanks to my fellow seminar organizer, Dorota Kowalczyk, we introduced a section about interpretations of Central Europe from a post-colonial perspective, the perspective section of the seminar. I'm very glad that we added this section, as we have received excellent papers on this topic, but this approach may be unfamiliar to some of you. A post-colonial approach to Central Europe is supported by historical similarities between Central Europe in a narrow sense, a narrow geographical sense of Jörg Konrad's nations between Russia and Germany, <coughs> and parts of the world that have usually been considered as having been affected by European colonialism. For the period before 1918, the focus is on Central Europe's position vis-à-vis -vis Imperial, Rus Imperial Russia, Germany, and Austria-Hungary, and can be considered in a similar way as Ireland's position in relation to Britain prior to independence. However, most papers in the perspective section are concerned with post-1945 Central Europe, in which the Soviet Union can be regarded as an imperial power, and communism is viewed as a form of colonialism. The resemblance with, with colonialism in other regions of the world rests on the existence of center-periphery relationships, communism as a sort of enforced modernization, and the Soviet Union playing the role of an outside political and military power. On the basis of these similarities, post-colonial theory can be employed as a reading mode for discussing Central Europe's culture and history during communism and after, also in its relationship to the West. Before ending my remarks, two minutes left, I would like to add two points, one in each minute, to which Dorota also alerted me. First, the post-colonial perspective in Central Europe and on Central Europe has many schools and directions. One of these schools is post-dependence studies, which has been launched to prevent the mimicking of post-colonial theory in another historical and social space. Second, Adding the post-colonial perspective, uh, the very concept of Central Europe gains an interesting ambivalence. Under the Soviet domination and after the fall of communism, and perhaps now, Poles, for example, do not want to be considered Eastern European. Central Europe was a claim, and is a claim, not so much to territory, but to, of belonging, belonging to Europe. But funnily enough, Middle Europa, the original concept of Middle Europa, the beginning of the 20th century, was invented at the start of the 20th century as a German imperial sphere, a sphere of influence. So at least as a concept, Central Europe 
has an imperial provenance, which shows that some nations should spread their culture and influence others. In a way, then, subscribing to Central Europe against Eastern Europe is a bit of a contradictory move. It's now 30 minutes past nine, so <laughs> I don't excuse the gentlemen here. They will have to leave us. And we can start with our first session. And our first session will be chaired by Professor Michael North, or if you like, Michael North. And Professor Michael North is Professor of History at the University of Greifswald in Germany. And he specialized, among other things, in the history of Dutch colonial expansion. Schon offene Peinstwo, wieder am Sadechne Peinstwo auf Konferenz der Universität Frosvamiu. And now I'm switching to English, even though I would be able to speak in Polish a bit further. But the majority probably doesn't understand uh, Polish. And so it's a great pleasure to be uh, here in Wrocław. We had been preparing the seminar with Siegfried and Dorota and uh, the nice people from uh, the uh, Wrocław Hub. And uh, I was uh, in Wrocław or in Breslau for the first time in 1977, so long ago, and it has, of course, uh, changed. And in this time, I was studying uh, Silesian history, supervised by the famous late Polish historian Benedict uh, Sientara, who wrote on uh, Henrik Brodaty, Henrik with a bird, who was very much stimulating uh, uh, German colonization in uh, those areas. So we are right back uh, to the topic, even though it's different. Uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce to you uh, today for the first keynote, Darius Kowojcik, uh, one of the famous uh, Polish uh, historians. Uh, right now, uh, he is, uh, or he has been at the University uh, of uh, Warsaw. He has been director of, of the University of Warsaw of the history department. And he has been uh, one of the late students of Marian Mowowist and uh, 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 Monchak, uh, Anthony Monchak. So he's very much familiar with this uh, European uh, approach uh, to the topic. Uh, he's specializing his research especially on Poland, Lithuania, and the Ottoman uh, Empire, and has written a couple of books, uh, and I checked uh, those. For example, Najwaśniejsze Publikacje Podole pod Panowaniem Tureckim, Ejalet Kamieniecki, and uh, then he's speaking on Roman, Ottoman, Polish uh, diplomatic relations. That's an uh, edited volume of documents. Uh, quite famous is uh, his uh, last book, The Crimean Canade and Poland Lithuania, which got a prize, if I remember this uh, right. And uh, what I would like to recommend you is uh, the edited volume uh, which he has had been editing uh, on. A comparative approach to imperial uh, culture, universal empire, which is a uh, must reading more or less for every imperial uh, historian. So uh, I won't steal your time, so, and it's a pleasure to have you here.
I can sit here. Do some sort of... Najgorzej, że to w ogóle nie działa teraz. Aha. I wanted to make my paper more attractive, but now we have more problems. Now. Okay, it works. I hope so. Uh, yeah. Martin. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much for having me. Um, and I will start. Um, two contradictive views shape our view of the place of Poland on the global map since the Middle Ages till the present day. A powerful vision developed by Marian Małowicz and popularized in the West by Emanuel Wallerstein. Uh, what happened now? Okay. Um, uh, has presented Poland and the whole Eastern Europe as a semi-colony of Western Europe, a laboratory for Western capital and trade where tools for future global domination had been developed. Yet on the other hand, Poland, inhabited by white Christians, has benefited for centuries from its geopolitical placement within Europe. In the 16th and 17th centuries, Poland took its share in American silver, while Polish missionaries contributed to the rise of European colonial knowledge by traveling as far as Iran and China. Although the missionary activity of the Polish Catholic Church was mainly focused on home India, as Ukrainian Orthodox provinces were dubbed in the 17th century. This term home India is interesting. It belongs to the 17th century um, uh, language. Um, uh, Polish, um, in the 19th century, Polish lands willingly or unwillingly benefited from the Russian colonial expansion, advocated earlier in that century by a Polish aristocrat and famous writer, Jan Potocki. Before the outbreak of World War I, textiles woven in wood were distributed throughout the Russian Empire, while the metal industry in Warsaw produced thousands of statues of Buddha for the Mongolian market. At the same time, the writings by Henryk Sienkiewicz were full of Orientalist and racial prejudices paired with the praise for the British colonial enterprise. This somewhat schizophrenic attitude towards the place of Poland on the world map is neatly visible if one compares the writings of two Polish 20th century intellectuals whose impact reached far beyond their native country, Oskar Halecki and Ignacy Sachs. In his highly idealized vision, Halecki regarded Poland as an integral part of the freedom-loving West, sharply contrasted with despotic Russia, which in his eyes belonged to the world of Orient. Needless to say, this view had more to do with Halecki's political views than with any scholarly analysis. At the same time, Ignacy Sachs wrote fascinating essays on the mechanism of backwardness, informed by his Polish-Jewish background, school-time Brazilian experience, and multiple travels to Indian Kerala. For Sachs, who for some time worked as an assistant to the prominent economist Michał Kalecki, Poland was a typical member of the group of underdeveloped countries whose main task was to catch up with the West. These two contrasting views are still present in the Polish collective mind. They also touch the possible question whether the Poles should feel responsible and guilty for the present unequal global wealth distribution and for the racial prejudices still influential in the Western world, or rather they should expect apologies from their Western neighbors for centuries of economic exploitation. Such possibility to look at one's own past as that of an exploiter and at the same time of a victim seems very stimulating. Unfortunately, sometimes it comes as a caricature. It's not hard to find today around us politicians who boast of racial and cultural superiority over the non-European world, at the same time expecting apologies from the West. Uh, in the present paper, I intend to focus on the Polish trade relations with Muslim neighbors and on the roads of three selective commodities which were massively transported between Poland, Lithuania, and the Ottoman Empire in the early modern era. 
namely slaves, tobacco, and silver coin. If studied in isolation, each of these commodities assigned Poland a different role in the geography of the global market, work and know-how distribution, and places it differently vis-a-vis -vis its large Muslim neighbor. Only when studied together, they reveal the complex character of the relation between Central Eastern Europe and its Western and Southeastern neighbors, reaching through their mediation as far as the New World and the Middle East. A few years ago, while writing a book on the diplomatic relation between Poland, Lithuania, and the Crimean Khanate, I noticed that Crimean documents sent by the Tatar Hans to the Polish kings were usually written on Italian paper, imported to the Crimea through Istanbul and the Black Sea. On the other hand, the royal gifts to the Hans, which the latter regarded as a yearly tribute, mainly constituted of English cloth. I found it then um, a telling example providing a proof that both countries, of both countries' peripheral status, as already at that time they were dependent on Western industry and know-how, Italian and English respectively. In fact, there was one Polish domestic commodity that found appraisal on the Oriental markets and was in constant demand in Istanbul and Cairo. But this issue brings even more confusion. These were slaves. And I, I put here, you can enjoy yourself, this quotation by um, um, Louis Darvier, a French traveler and writer. Uh, I will remind you, it is over 100 years before Casanova, you all remember the beginning of Larry Wolf's book on inventing Eastern Europe. And it's, 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 it's simply beautiful, because he presents this cargo full of uh, white East European women that, who can be purchased. Uh, uh, there's a comic element even because they got the first class on the ship. The ship is English. The English are doing a cabotage for the Ottoman internal market, mm -hmm. uh, trading white slaves, East European Christian slaves, from um, Izmir, Smyrna to Alexandria. Um, and the more, the, 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 this cargo consists of uh, nice girls who are Polish, but also Muscovites, Russians. Uh, and the Polish, they were probably Ukrainians between the Polish and the Russians, uh, and probably they were majority, but we don't know. Uh, it's not proved here. And the Circassians, the, the Circassians, of course, Western Caucasian. Uh, so so I'm, I'm not going to make a seminar on Avrier, but it is uh, anyway fascinating, this, 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 this view. Um, well, uh, according to my own overall estimations, based on studies by Polish, Russian, Turkish, and Ukrainian uh, scholars, as many as two million slaves might have crossed the Black Sea in the years 1500 to 1700, which is more than the number of black slaves that probably crossed the Atlantic in the same period. Philip Cartin's classical estimation was one and a half million. He was criticized by African historians who claimed that it was more than two million. But anyway, I'm not going to prove that everything in detail is, is correct, but the, 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 the general numbers might have been comparable. Also, we must also remember that the Atlantic slave trade reached its apex in the 18th century when the Black Sea trade was already in decay. Uh, more than a half of these slaves originated from Poland, Lithuania. The rest being composite, composed of Moscow slave trade was even more detrimental to the region concerned than the Atlantic slave to West Africa. As unlike many an African ruler, Polish-Lithuanian authorities didn't get any benefits from the export of slaves <laughs> raiding um, 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 because the slave raiding was effected against their will of authorization. Admittedly, at least three times, Polish authorities authorized the Tatars to leave the kingdom along with the captured human chattel. But they were forced to do so in order to evade an even larger destruction, and hence they bought peace rather than made a successful commercial transaction. The Tatars were thus illegally allowed to leave Poland along with captured slaves in the years 1649, 1653, and 1667. In the last case, it was no one else than the future king and hero of the siege of Vienna, Hetman Jan Sobieski, who authorized the Tatars to leave with their prey unmolested. Looked from this angle, um, the territories of early modern Eastern Europe, especially present-day Ukraine, constituted the least developed and most exploited area in global exchange, providing unskilled human workforce to the Ottoman market and getting nothing in return. There is certainly a grain of truth in the observation made by Paul Rico, a British 17th century diplomat and writer who spent many years in the Ottoman Empire, I quote, were it not for the abundant supplies of slaves would daily come from the Black Sea, 
considering the summer slaughters of the plague and destructions of war, the Turk would have little cause to boast of the vast numbers of his people. Let us move to our second commodity, namely American tobacco. If we examine the traditional Polish vocabulary related to smoking tobacco, which with such words as lulka, cybuch, kapciuch, antypka, and finally tytoń, we will find out that they are mostly of Turkish origin. Only the terms fajka and tabaka reveal that Polish Western neighbors, Germans and Scots, had also some share in distributing the new fashion. In the 17th century, tobacco was named in Polish tabaka or tytoń, alternatively. Yet with the time, the former term has been retained merely to denote snuff, and the final victory belonged to the, to the Turkish loanword tytoń. An engraving contained in a pamphlet published in 1650 and devoted to the habit of smoking proves that already by that time smoking tobacco was associated in Poland with Muslim Orient. We see there a Turk wearing a turban and smoking a long pipe, a German drinking a glass of wine or beer, and a poor Paul in the middle apparently trying to make his choice. The pace of domestication of the new crops obtained through Colombian exchange in the Ottoman lands is still under research. These crops are not mentioned in the Quran, hence they were not subject to legal taxation and thus rarely appear in Ottoman sources. But that very reason stimulated Ottoman peasants to their fast adoption. If you cultivate maize or tobacco, you don't pay taxes because there is nothing about the taxes on maize and tobacco in the Quran. So that's a very, very logical explanation, but that's also why the his historians cannot find many information on these crops in the Ottoman um, registers or tax registers because they are not taxed again. Um, we still have to wait for in-depth studies that would apply palynological records to learn more about the dynamics of adoption of such crops as tobacco, tomato, bell pepper, and especially maize. Yet already today, thanks to the studies by Ivan Sakazov, Trajan Stojanovic, Fehmi Ilomas, and other scholars, we know that especially maize and tobacco entered the Ottoman lands quite fast. In his highly applauded monograph, Maize and Grace, James McCann addresses the confusing fact that in Europe, maize took on names like Turcum Frumentum or Frumentum Asiaticum, and he regards it as an indication of general confusion about its origins in the New World. He might be right, although such interpretation presents Europe as the continent of geographical idiots, with Frenchmen referring um, to maize as Bleu Turque or Bleu de Turquie, Italians as Grand Turco, and Germans as Turkish corn or Turkish Weizen. Yet, why not assume that the people simply observed where from maize was coming? When the Poles, Czechs, and Slovenians referred to maize as Pszenica Turecka, Turkinie, and Turszczica, respectively, Hungarians as Terek Bob, Turkish Broadbeam, Southern Slavs as Arabka, an Arab, and Turks as Mesir Budai, or simply Mesir, which is Egyptian wheat, or simply Egypt, they all pointed to the southern direction. Apparently, having crossed the Atlantic, maize and tobacco shortly arrived from Spain to Egypt, and from then entered central Ottoman lands to travel further on to central and eastern Europe. In spite of religious barriers and the holy war fought between the Spanish and Ottoman empires, communication across the 16th century Mediterranean seemed to be fast, be it for humans, crops, silver, or venereal diseases. Unlike tobacco, maize stopped short of entering early modern Poland, making impact only in eastern Carpathians, inhabited by Wallachian and Ruthenian peasants. Polish peasants had to wait for the benefits of Colombian exchange till the arrival of top potato two centuries later. Therefore, I treat maize only marginally here. The last commodity to be reconsidered in the present paper is silver coin. Um, here you have the map from Shevket Pamuk uh, showing the uh, uh, silver mines in the Ottoman Empire and also means. So of course, Istanbul is not a place of a silver mine, uh, it's a capital, but, but uh, you had um, uh, silver mines in uh, present-day Serbia and Bosnia, which were mostly exploited by the end of the 16th century. The only surviving silver mines that still worked were in northeastern Anatolia, you know, Gimushane, uh, which is not here, but close to Erz, not far from Erzurum, um, but it was not enough uh, for, the, for the Ottoman market. Um, so due to limited local supply of silver, the early modern Ottoman Empire imported tons of silver, mostly of American origin, and one of important trade routes led through Poland, from Amsterdam to Danzig, 
and further all from Lvov to Constantinople. Silver was necessary to pay the Sultan's troops, oil the imperial economy, and pay for luxury products imported from Iran, India, and China. In the 17th century, the Ottomans were so desperately cash hungry that they even accepted debased European coinage on their market without even remitting the imported foreign coins into Ottoman units, notwithstanding the fact that the right of mint belonged to chief prerogatives of a sovereign Muslim ruler. So the circulation of foreign coins in his domains was detrimental to the prestige of Ottoman Sultan. Yet, as it was aptly observed by Shevkat Pamuk, debased coinage was better than no coinage. I would add <laughs> foreign coinage was better than no coinage. Um, apart uh, from Dutch Levant dollars or Lion Thalers, massively exported through Poland into the Ottoman lands and immortalized today in the names of the Bulgarian, Romanian, and Moldavian currency, Lev or Leo, which means lion in these languages. Poland also exported its own currency, especially silver orts or quarter thalers, minted in Danzig and several other centers. Only between 16, you, you see here an ort minted in Danzig and an ort from Bydgoszcz. Bydgoszcz was probably the most yeah. important mint place in, in, in the Kingdom of Poland proper. Uh, I'm not going to discuss the level of autonomy of Danzig here. Um, only between 1616 and 1621, the mint of Danzig produced over 13 million of orts. Large numbers of 17th century Polish orts have been identified in the hordes discovered in present day Bulgaria, Macedonia, Greece, Turkey, but also Iraq and Georgia. Yet by far the greatest career was made by a silver coin termed in Ottoman sources as Zolota. In his monograph of 17th century Istanbul, Robert Mantran devoted special attention to this coin. I can read this quotation. Il est encore une monnaie d'origine étrangère que l'on trouve à Constantinople. C'est le Zolota, ou Iselot, pièce en principe polonaise, mais largement imitée, puisque Vénitiens, Anglais et Hollandais en frappent, qui d'ailleurs sont dans un loi de plus en plus bon. The prototype of Zolota was indeed a Polish light taller named Zwoty, because it consisted of 30 groschen, uh, which contained less silver than ordinary taller. Interestingly, in the Polish royal mints, it was struck in limited quantities, but it was eagerly adopted as a model by counterfeiters, not just Venetians, Englishmen, and Dutchmen, but also Ragusans and Germans. The piece had become so popular in the Ottoman lands that when in 1690, the Ottoman government resolved to mint its own large silver coin, the coin obtained the name Zolota, or to distinguish it from the Polish prototype, the new Zolota, Zolota i Jedid, or Jedid Zolota. Here we should come at the conclusion. If we focus on slave trade, early modern Eastern Europe presents itself as the most desolate region of the globe, constantly raided and deprived of human and material capital. In the conclusion of his book devoted to Russia's southern steppe frontier, Michael Khodorkovsky refers to the, the numbers of towns and cities not built and fields not plowed, and proposes that the shortage of urban centers in early modern Russia, I quote again, may in no small degree be related to the nature of Russia's southern frontier. Analogous conclusions can be drawn in regard to towns not built and fields not plowed in early modern Poland Lithuania, especially its southern Ukrainian provinces. If we focus on tobacco and maize, the region of Central Eastern Europe presents itself somewhat better in a role of a conscious and choosy consumer who nonetheless adopts agricultural innovations not directly from the New World, not even through the mediation of Western Europe, but through the mediation of Egypt, Asia Minor, and Ottoman Balkans. Finally, if we focus on silver coin, the region presents itself as a much more lucky beneficiary of American windfall, so aptly described by William McNeil and Kenneth Pomeranz with the Polish Zolota shaping the monetary system of the Middle East long before it was replaced by Austrian thalers with Basti uh, Maria Theresia, which even today form the most valued element of the dowry of Yemeni brides. Which of the three above pictures was true? An impressionist historian like the present author can only wait for hard data to be provided by real historians, <laughs> namely economic historians. <laughs> Yet my instinct says that neither of the three alternative pictures is correct, or rather, they are correct all at the same time. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Darius, for reconfiguring Central Europe. And now we, what uh, Siegfried uh, has already uh, to told us, uh, that there's a lot of concepts now. We have an economic concept and, of course, a reconfigured economic concept of Central Europe. And so you don't believe any longer in Maoist and Palestine? <laughs> well, <laughs> Let, that's for the discussion. Uh, and we have, uh, fortunately, we have Peter Emma with us. So the slave trade will be discussed later as well. Uh, okay, and I could of course speak about Suchaba and things like that on money and so on. But the next speaker would be uh, Werner Scheltjens uh, from Belgium via the Netherlands, uh, who ended up in Leipzig. <laughs> and he is still there, and he made it by car from uh, Leipzig uh, uh, to Wroclaw. Werner Seltjens uh, was uh, an MA A student at Leuven uh, University, and then he switched to Groningen, where he wrote uh, his dissertation uh, in Dutch, uh, which is uh, De Invloed van Ruimteleke Veranderingen op Operationele Strategien in de Vroeg Moderne Nederlandse Scheepvaart. And uh, this book has been reworked and revised and came out with Brill uh, last year, Dutch Deltas, Emergence, Functions, and Structure of the Low Countries Maritime Transport System. And he is very much influential in uh, working on the sound toll registers and uh, making the sound toll register a new tool or a more usable tool uh, for our research as economic historians. So good morning. Welcome to you all. I right away introduce yet another concept which is a little more uh, a little different from colonialism, of course, it is more generally the new world. And I will speak a bit about the commodity flows between Central Europe and the new world. The title is full of concepts here. The ideas of Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, one of Europe's leading thinkers in the late 17th and early 18th centuries, and author of this beautiful citation here, were prototypical for the perception of the changing role of Muscovy in transit trade from Persia, India, and China to Western Europe. The geographical scope of Leibniz's writings and the increasing awareness of a vast Eurasian space that tied Western Europe and China may be seen as a sublime account of the innovations that took place in the European minds. From now on, the world was encompassed, not only by sea, but also by land, because of Muscovy's eastern expansion during the 17th century. The central role of the Russian Empire in this novel constellation, which found expression in Leibniz's writings and was acknowledged in the rapid intensification of Western Europe's diplomatic and political interaction with the Russian Empire, marked the beginning of a new era in world history in which the Baltic would play a significant role, at least for some time. Now that one of the driving forces of Eurasian exchange had gained a strong foothold on its shore, a North Eurasian system of commercial exchange emerged, not only in the minds of political leaders and economic thinkers, but also in the operations of the system's actors. The Baltic, as well as the Black and White Seas became border and conflict zones in the North Eurasian system of commercial exchange. These maritime border and conflict zones also served as gateways for the importation of overseas commodities to Central Europe and by extension to North Eurasia. In the following sections, a survey of commodity flows between the Americas, Asia and Central Europe is pursued which is based on statistics derived from the Santo registers online, on one hand, and novel statistical data about the structure of Russia's foreign trade on the other. The focus of the survey lies on the commodity flows between the vast Russian hinterland, stretching all the way to Kiachta on the Russian-Chinese uh, border, and the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth before and after the partitions of Poland. 
The survey has a preliminary character and several important limitations apply. Commodities from the new world cannot easily be identified in the sources. Therefore, the present survey is limited to indigo and sugar as Atlantic overseas goods on one hand and to cottons, silks and tea as Asian goods on the other. Cotton and silk manufacturers pose particular problems. They were imported to the Baltic from several European ports, but their location of production is, largely, is unknown, which makes it impossible to identify them as overseas goods. Therefore, the present survey only takes into account the overland importation of Chinese cottons, silks, and tea. Moreover, in the course of the 19th century, European sugar beet production started to complement sugar imports from the Caribbean. Insofar as sugar imported to the ports in the Baltic originated partly from European ports, it becomes hard to distinguish between the two. In short, this preliminary survey is limited to the following commodity flows, the maritime importation to ports in the Baltic of sugar and indigo, and the overland importation from China of cottons, silks, and tea. Only the most significant <coughs> ports in the Baltic are observed, Danzig and Stettin on one hand, and St. Petersburg and Riga on the other. Here come the data. The volumes of indigo imported to Danzig and Stettin in 1764 were relatively small. Most of it arrived from Bordeaux, <coughs> some indigo from Amsterdam. Remarkably, the volumes of indigo imported to St. Petersburg were almost as large as those that went to Amsterdam, uh, to Danzig and Stettin taken together, but the main suppliers were Amsterdam and London rather than Bordeaux. Imports of indigo to Riga were negligible. More significant than indigo, at least insofar as volumes are concerned, was the importation of sugar to the Baltic. In 1764, European middlemen dominated the importation of sugar to ports in the Baltic. Sugar was imported to Danzig, mostly from London, Amsterdam, and Hamburg. Quite differently, Stettin's major supplying ports were Bordeaux and Nantes. London ranked only third. The import pattern of St. Petersburg, which received less sugar than Stettin and Danzig in 1764, was different again. Most of the sugar supply to the Russian capital arrived from Hamburg, Amsterdam, and Bordeaux. Some 50 tons, however, were imported directly from overseas from the port of Monte Cristi in the French colony of Saint-Domingue. Around the mid-18th century, maritime overseas commodity flows to ports in the Baltic were firmly in the hands of the major ports of the colonial powers, France, Great Britain, and the Dutch Republic. Chinese goods entered the North Eurasian system of commercial exchange via Kyachta at the Russo-Chinese border, from where they were transported to central Russia via a complex system of rivers and overland routes. Some of the Chinese goods that were imported to the Russian Empire were exported subsequently to the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth via illustrious toll stations such as Vasilkov, Dabryansk, and Nierzin, an important marketplace on the left bank of the Dnieper, the so-called Lievobirizhia, which had become part of the Russian Empire in 1654. Furthermore, Chinese goods also left the Russian Empire via the toll stations of the Shelyegovskaya Zastava, which probably bordered White Russia in the vicinity of Smolensk, and the Baevskaya Zastava, which bordered White Russia near Vityebsk. Finally, small quantities of Chinese goods were also exported to Central Asia via Astrakhan and to Western Europe via St. Petersburg. The largest quantities of Chinese goods were exported from Vasilkov and Dabryansk, the two toll stations that were strongly connected to the commodity flows passing through Nizhin. The total value of exports of Chinese goods via these toll stations was 77,000 rubles approximately, which is, which is just under 1% of total exports from the Russian Empire in 1764. The differences, ah, okay. 
The differences between 17, uh, 1764 and 1834, that is my second year that I took out, were significant, both from the maritime perspective and from the perspective of overland trade. In 1834, London had become the almost exclusive supplier of much declined quantities of indigo and sugar to Danzig. Contrastingly, the volume of sugar imports to Stettin had increased by almost 38%. At the same time, the suppliers of Stettin had radically changed as well. Bordeaux did not deliver any sugar to Stettin in 1834. In its place, London had emerged as its major supplier, followed by Antwerp, Liverpool, Hamburg and Bremen. Like before, European ports controlled the sugar imports to Danzig and Stettin. Imports of indigo to both places were negligible. The situation in Stettin and Danzig differed radically from that of St. Petersburg and to a lesser extent Riga. The volume of indigo and before all sugar imports to both Russian ports in the Baltic had boomed. In 1834, more than 383 tons of indigo were imported from London, Liverpool and Amsterdam, but small quantities were imported directly from the North American ports of New York and Boston as well. Direct transatlantic commodity flows were much stronger for the sugar imports to St. Petersburg and Riga than for Danzig and Stettin. The manifold increase in the volumes of sugar imported to both Russian Baltic ports was accounted for by the Cuban ports of Havana and Matanzas, as well as the Pernambuco region in Brazil. The annual st uh, trade statistics which the Russian government had started to publish in a re regular series since 1812, reveal the significant differences in the value of indigo and sugar. In 1834, 25,000 25, pud of indigo was valued at about 5 million rubles, or 188 rubles per pud, whereas sugar had become a product of mass consumption with a value of only about 14 rubles per pud. Food is 16,4 kilograms. Based on imports to the Baltic amounting to uh, 21 million rubles in total in 1834, sugar now accounted for more than 10% of the total value of Russian imports to the Baltic. The import of Chinese goods underwent significant changes as well between 1764 and 1834. The share of tea imports, which had been very small in the 18th century, in the total estimated value of imports to Russia rose from 0.9% uh, to 3.37% in 1834. Almost all tea was imported via Kiachta, though small quantities were imported via Odessa on the Black Sea and via Georgia as well. The volume of tea imports via Kiachta to Russia continued to grow in the 19th century. In 1834, more than 172,000 puts were imported, which were valued at just over 7 million rubles. Small but high-valued quantities were exported, mostly to the Kingdom of Poland. In contrast, the importation of kitaiki, those are the cottons uh, that were produced in China, before the 19th century, and silk fabrics declined strongly in the 19th century. Whereas around the mid 18th century, Chinese cottons accounted for 60% and more of all Chinese imports to Russia, their share had started to fall markedly after 1800. The massive importation of cotton and silk yarn and fabrics from Great Britain, the Hanseatic towns and Prussia to Russian ports in the Baltic and Russian cities along the western land border, as well as increasing textile manufacturing in Russia, which has started exporting cotton manufacturing to China as early as 1824, seem to have caused this decline. Time. Okay. Even though an abridged survey like this one has many limitations, some preliminary conclusions might be formulated on, the, on its basis. First of all, Leibniz's grand vision for Russia as the new empire of the middle did not really come true. Overland trade from China to the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth was of limited volume and value both in 1764 and 1834, especially if compared to the massive growth of imports to the Baltic. 
European ports controlled the importation of indigo and sugar in 1764 and still had a significant share in 1834. However, sugar imports to Russian ports in the Baltic were now in different hands and direct transatlantic connections between Cuba and Russia were established. Many questions require further research, however. The impact of the emergent sugar, sugar beet industries in Stettin, Danzig and other Baltic ports on the structure of commodity flows with the New World will be analyzed at a later stage. Perhaps the most puzzling finding is that of the transit of tea from Austria to the port of Odessa, which went through the Radzivilovskaya toll station. From the late 1830s onwards, the overland transit from Austria to Odessa started to decline rapidly, and by 1844, tea had completely disappeared as a transit item. Perhaps the emergence of these commodity flows, as well as their rapid decline, resulted from the growth of Odessa. The latter, this is my final point, is, substan is, su is substantiated by the example of a merchant of Rylsk in the Kursk district in 1834, who decided to send the goods bought in the Steiermark from Trieste to Odessa, rather than over the land route via Brode. Further research will have to address what had initially provoked these novel strategies and how they changed the commodity flows between Central Europe and the New World, as well as the structure of the North Eurasian system of commercial exchange. Thank you. Thank you, Werner, for this uh, new insights into uh, a comparative approach uh, with respect to the land and the sea routes, which uh, is a promising topic, and we will learn about this. Just one question. Was there any tea import? Probably there was uh, via the Baltic harbors. A little bit. A little but bit. Not much. Not much. Oh, good. So perhaps Darius would join us, and then we would uh, start the discussion. Questions to our first speakers? We have quite some time. Yes, please, go ahead. <coughs> Perhaps you could mention your name first. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question to uh, Professor Kovacic. Uh, what is your opinion on the Russian Baltic Railway system? Uh, yes, the first question is uh, there is a dispute by Amanda and Dobie about rentalizing. Uh, and some of the goods who are speaking this. Uh, well, and apparently, this is that uh, actually it was a way of selling these two banners because uh, they were not, they didn't want to be associated with the slave workforce. So, uh, I would like to ask you what you think about that. Is it uh, uh, about uh, this? Yes? So, we. Yes, the Lago and Ode is from America, yeah. were rentalized uh, in 18th century and 19th century. Rentalized. And she thinks that it's more of a <coughs> way of selling these goods in the deposited image than uh, uh, because uh, slave and work for slave trade and very yeah, th that would explain a later perception, 18th, 19th century. Although I remember from seminars of Peter Burke in 1919 Cambridge, he was showing us pamphlets and uh, after the Methodist rise in England, showing this old uh, uh, preachers, Christian preachers arguing with each other, beating each other, and a Count Turk uh, sitting behind the window and smoking a pipe. And the reasonable, clever guy in this picture was this Turk, who was orientalized in a way. So if orientalization in 18th century still can be positive, uh, but it, it doesn't, but, so um, I would agree for, for, for Western Europe for 18th century that it might have been, in a way, making exotic and making better purchasable. But in 1650, Poland, well, we have Sarmatis, we have the, something that is uh, self-orientalization of Poland. Uh, so so uh, if we include uh, tobacco smoking with, uh, with Sarmatis, which is the, the Polish cultural uh, phenomenon, uh, yes, 
I would, I would agree. That they, were, they were wearing uh, Turkish uh, dresses, they, they were dressed a la moda barbaresca, as observed in Italy when the Polish embassy came to, to Rome. Um, uh, so, so yes, but uh, the problem is whether we should uh, use the term orientalist towards Sarmatis, which is a, which is a great question, by, by the way. But uh, we associate some uh, orientalist rather, my, my feeling, with the 18th and 19th century. Mm -hmm. so, uh, something like that. Okay. Good. So, I just have, I have a short question. Um, I mean that uh, you, you showed that there, are, there were no direct uh, trade with America in the 18th century. Uh, but actually, is that it? not just a, a thing about the law, because there is this exclusive commercial system of the commercial powers. So for me, it wasn't really, it, it was quite logical that he brought it from, from France directly. Um, did it change? Or how did it change? Uh, they did not have their own. No, that's not really true. Some of them did have a few colonies, Sweden and uh, Denmark, a little bit, uh, but they couldn't compete with the big ones like France and Great Britain. And that changed in the 19th century. As soon as the, um, there's this uh, independence movement in the early 19th century, and as soon as that started, Russia almost immediately sent uh, diplomats over to start to establish or try to establish direct connections. And that is the effect that you can see if you compare these two years. But of course, this is a gradual change. More questions to our speakers, please. Stefan yeah. Kevin, uh, University of So, I have not a question, but a small remark regarding the intelligence. Uh, you have talked about two times, two years, 18th century, 1764, and then 1834. It's a different situation because there is no more the Lithuanian and the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth. I would say very much three nations, including also Ukrainian, but it didn't come true. But you have told us the figures for the sugar beet. And for me, it was interesting to see it. You compare it with Russia and also with Shetinazi. And I know it's also because of Napoleon and the continental blockade mm -hmm. in 1885. So they had to find a new source. They found sugar beet. And it started not far from here. I say it's Schlesien, but I can also say Silesia or Lower Silesia, mm -hmm. not far from Wolfsburg, somewhere in the 20s. The sugar beet starts not far from our city. Would you like to comment on it? Uh, yes, I, I didn't want to imply that the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth still existed. I just hinted at the partitions of Poland and then at the Kingdom of Poland in the 1830s. So, of course, there's an entire change of situations uh, happening between these two years that I picked out. I'm aware of that. Okay. Um, about the sugar beet. I did not present figures on the sugar beet production. I just presented figures on overseas imports mm -hmm. to St. Petersburg and Danzig. And it could be, could be, but I'm not entirely sure that the decline in sugar imports to Danzig was a result of sugar beet production coming up at that time. I'm not entirely convinced. I think that only happens later, and I think that the sugar beet producers in the Netherlands were more effective than um, the ones in uh, right here. And you see, after 1834, uh, in the 1840s, there's a new upswing in sugar imports from Amsterdam, Rotterdam, Le Havre, and those were also uh, regions where sugar beet was uh, being sure. produced. So. Send the lady beside you. Yes. I'm following the line of the previous comment. When you speak about 1764, did you came across? Did you came? Did you got some information about the role of the Persian Cossacks? 
Crimean Tatars, uh, no high courts when it comes to transit routes. Um, maybe. Uh, and then when you, I was, I was very much interested in the role of Odessa, uh, Odessa court. And then you wrote that the rapid decline, about the rapid decline in the second half of the uh, 1830s when it comes to Odessa. Was it a permanent uh, decline? Uh, because that was, it was a very poor time uh, in this region due to the Russian-Turkish war. And uh, Odessa wasn't blockade. So basically the whole Asian searches was a disaster when it comes to this region. Uh, I have been interested in the green transit um, routes. And um, maybe you also, did you, did you have any information about the role of Mennonites in green transit? Because that was that was true in, in uh, exactly via Odessa in 1850s, and that, that was the peak of Odessa port development as a big transit uh, spot. Thank you for your for your input. Was very interesting. Okay, thank you. Um, I I come across information about particular groups that are involved in. Uh, transporting and trading commodities, but that is not my focus. So I'm not dealing with Mennonites or Kalmykians or whatever, um, or whoever, I'm sorry. Um, <coughs> um, I, I only deal with the, with the figures, the, yeah. the, the quantities. Um, so the far, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> I think you have to get the figures right first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. But about Odessa, that is a more important uh, point. The decline in the 1830s was temporary, um, just for a few years, and after that it goes up again, especially after 1840. Uh, I would say it more precisely after the, the Straits question was settled in 1841 then Odessa starts to boom. And that also changes the direction of the grain trade, which previously went through the Baltic. Mm -hmm. It now changes and goes through the Black Sea, the, the, through uh, the port of Odessa, uh, massively, not a little bit. And that also has an impact on the grain producing regions. They shift a little further eastwards. And there, perhaps the Mennonites you mentioned uh, start to play an important role. So I agree with you that Odessa um, is the rising port in this system in the uh, first half of the 19th century. And so if you go a little bit later, we could say that Finnish shipping, which was Russian shipping at the same time, was one of the major media of exporting grain from Odessa. Finnish? Finnish, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Good. So, so, but Herr Uffelmann is the next one. Yeah. I've got a question for Professor Kovacic. I was intrigued by your short consideration about the differences between <coughs> Orientalism and the Satan sense and the Polish tradition of pre modern positive self orientalization. Um, this is something I argue in recent articles in a comparable way, um, finding a kind of anchoring point in the third petition of the 19th century when this positive attitude changes a bit negative. <coughs> West European style of Orientalism. But I'm wondering about your talk, whether you could elaborate upon the, uh, the interconnection between this massive economic underdevelopment, which you were talking about, and the tradition of positive self orientalization Is the inferiority of East Central Europe produced first and then overcompensated by a kind of positive self orientalization or is it the other way around? That's a great question. But I think that we largely uh, look at pre -modern, uh, early modern period through 19th century lenses. We still, I can't help. So it's, it's quite confused. But when I'm thinking um, in the century, in the 16th century, where, where Sarmatis is began, began, there's no reason to, 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 to feel um, as a loser, so th there is something original. But there is a recent article by Adam Yashinsky published in Mukarnas uh, uh, and in a publication about the Polish Orientalists. And he is posing the question whether it's uh, the fashion adopted from the enemy to, to change its meaning and, and, and to show. So he's also 
dealing with this tricky um, question. I think that in the in the 16th and 17th century, um, Polish Orientalism, well, Polish Sarmatism, uh, might reflect a feeling of cultural inferiority. But I wouldn't link it to to economic. But later on, 18th century is, 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 is different. Uh, I, I still have to reconsider your, your, your question because I was thinking to myself, when you want to put something on the market with a label oriental, you assume that your customer wants to buy it because it's oriental, which works for France after Colbert, uh, which works for Britain probably in the 18th century, I don't know how earlier, but uh, my sources uh, suggesting that tobacco is of Eastern origin are earlier. So there is no, there is no reason to uh, put tobacco on the market with, 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 with a label in the assumption that uh, the customer will buy it. So later on, yes. Well, sorry, sorry I didn't really answer the question, but yeah. it's impossible. Now, uh, Nick Kenny is the next uh, one, please. I think it's unfortunate as far as sugar production is concerned because the French islands were desperately down on sugar output and the ability to trade right all during the Seven Years' War. And I cannot imagine they were back to full capacity production by 1764, both because their equipment would have been broken during the period of embargo and because they had not been able to get slaves in during those years. So uh, I'd say if you had taken a date three or four years later, they would have been back to full production and Bordeaux would have become altogether more prominent as the supplier of sugar. Uh, yes. yes, that is perhaps true, but there are no Russian trade statistics for three or four years later. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yeah, I understand. Yeah. yeah, you had a question, Andrew? Oh, yes. Yeah. And Professor Emory University, for Werner, do you have any sense of the state of the sugar or sugar byproducts that are coming into the Baltic ports? Is it always purely refined, kind of quite high in market sugar, or are these Baltic ports also starting to engage in refined? Or do you have any sense of this? Um. As far as the source, the, the Danish sound ore registers can tell me. Okay. Um, I don't think the sugar is refined before it comes in, uh, especially in the later phase. Um, the sugar refineries in St. Petersburg and Danzig, they develop relatively early. But to some extent, it's refined in Hamburg already. To some extent, yeah. yes, of course. And then shipped. Yes, and in Amsterdam. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but I think the direct connections from Cuba to St. To Petersburg, yeah. that is non-refined. Yeah, yeah. And then the intermediate ports in Europe, that mm. would probably be refined. Mm. But perhaps not always. Mm. Good. I'm not entirely sure. And, uh, what, wollen Sie direkt dazu? Yeah, just one remark. And some of the leaders who should have refined at least were created by Germans from Hamburg. Yeah, yeah, so of course. They were the same time established in London. Yeah. If you look at the... Uh, individuals behind it, then uh, yet another facet. Yeah, okay. thank you. Good. Now, you had a question? Or, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I have a question. Yeah, uh, there's, there's so many. Uh, uh, hey, Matt from uh, my Institute for the Institute of Science. Um, for, for the first talk, does the question of the role of the Italians in the Black Sea region was in, in the trade? Especially on uh, goods that came from from America. From, um, well, this could be another layer maybe of traders involved in this um, um, in this sort of black, black, black sea um, trade. Another question: I'm asking for 1834. Maybe this. Maybe there is no surprise that no fresh sugar came in anymore because you have the Haiti and the Haiti. Uh, um, 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 when we meet to, today with my colleagues who are former seminar members, we make like jokes 
quoting Mawowis because he ended each his seminar with a quotation. It, is, it was not a, uh, an accident that Columbus was a Genovese. Um, and of course, the connection between Kaffa and America is obvious in, in this way. I also found that uh, the study of the family of Garibaldi's uh, and two brothers went to Spain, and one brother became a very high official at the court of the crime of Hanman Ligira, who even composed the first Polish, auto, uh, Polish crime and treaty, is composed uh, in Italian, in northern Italian dialect, by Garibaldi's. So, but um, there's a problem about Italian trade after the fall of Kaffa. So previously it was assumed that it was completely abolished by the Turks, the Turks moved the population and so on. Now we know it was not true. But the problem, how independent it was. Well, we, what this, I think that there might be a better connection, which is Ragusa, which is Dubrovnik. Yeah. Because the merchants from Dubrovnik had constant access to the Black Sea, and we know that they were quite um, uh, engaged in, in the Atlantic trade. They even provided the American Revolution with weapons uh, in, later in the 18th century. So uh, the, the, well, the Black Sea trade is still very much active, but I wouldn't say that there is something like that you can separate Italian uh, companies in, 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 that, in that period. But of course, the merchants of Pera, and, and so the, the, the connection is obvious uh, between Venice and the, the Black Sea was not entirely closed, like it was believed, like be, before it takes by Chernobyl and Mauritius uh, yeah. and uh, in yeah. Okay, good. Now it's your turn. Robert Stoja from Schleswig, Germany. The question of the Professor Kolodziewicz, I found your your presentation fascinating in linking the commodities to these narratives of, of victimhood and exploitation. Uh, but while I, it, was, it was pretty clear for me what you mean with, with tobacco and silver coin, I was wondering in what way do you link the, the slave trade to this notion that you've argued uh, for seeing uh, Central and Eastern Europe as a semi-colony of Western Europe, when you talk, when you talk about Western European economic exploitation, how does, this, how does the slave trade that you've mentioned, which is clearly going the other direction, relate to, to, to this? Because in your narrative, the, the other two fit more with this image of, of, of Poland benefiting from from its geographical and geopolitical position, whereas the slave trade would be the, the one that, that sends towards the narrative of victimhood. But I fail to see what's the connection with Western Europe in that. You are completely right by pointing to the flaws of the construction of my paper. <laughs> say, but the problem is that I was invited by my colleagues who knew that I was working on the uh, in relation with Islam. So my first okay. question was, why me and why the world? So then I decided to, to choose three uh, commodities that I was working myself, so I didn't want to, auto, to, to, to plagiarize. So at least I can say that I have some, some, some uh, experience with these three topics. And of course, you are right, but tobacco and silver are new work products. So I introduced them and I just showed that one of them is going from the north to the south and another is going the other way around. Um, with slaves, of course, you are, you are right. It's not a new uh, work product, but I, sh I try to show the parallels between slave trade and all these things within this course. So it's, it's not directly involved. It's, it's, it's a fascinating top, uh, topic which still deserves to be developed. Uh, there's a great paper by Martina, Marina Kravitz from Toronto um, who wrote about black slaves in the Crimea. Even in the Crimea, they have I, they cannot complain they don't have many slaves, or slaves enough. But still, because the Ottoman Sultan has a black chief eunuch mm -hmm. in his harem, the Crimean Han wants to have a black uh, eunuch in his harem too. So there is a small import of black slaves, but these slaves are again mostly from Ethiopia, and uh, what was today in Ethiopia. So no, they, they didn't need um, black slaves from, from the new, new world. So it was, the construction, I, I, I can argue, uh, two topics were directly linked to the new world, the slaves is just, just looking comparatively. And you could have enlarged it to slave trading in the Mediterranean, which was more or less uh, a link uh, to the Atlantic slave trade uh, from um, the Black Sea one. So would Peter Emmer comment as a slave trader? <laughs> <laughs> <What>? <laughs> I think as far as, the, as Africa is concerned, as the source of the slave trade, there are obviously several circuits in Africa, and the West African circuit is completely divorced from the East African circuit that mainly caters to the Middle East uh, and perhaps even to the Black Sea. Well, the West African uh, circuit, uh, what is it, 
caters exclusively to the new world. I think uh, Africa is a huge continent. It was possible to export people both sides without interference. Mm. Okay. We still have time for more questions? Well, perhaps uh, yeah. I could follow up on the yeah. questions regarding the sugar uh, production uh, <laughs> exports to uh, the Baltic. And uh, I was struck by the uh, two uh, figures for Danzig and Stettin. Obviously, the Dutch were rather important to Danzig in 1764. Uh, well, there were really uh, minimal suppliers for Stettin. Um, if we go from the assumption that sugar fetches the same price everywhere in open market, and that buyers buy sugar where it's cheapest, uh, this doesn't stand to reason. Uh, if the French, because of lower shipping costs and lower production costs, uh, were more competitive than the Dutch, why would that? Can I answer with a question? Please. Yeah. <laughs> Why would you start from that assumption? Uh, well, I'd like to hear the contrary, but obviously, <laughs> the economic view has it that commodities are traded on a free market. That, except if you have uh, what is the differences in subsidies and all that, uh, what is it? That that would actually hinder the free. Free competition, but going from the assumption that there is free competition, I, I hope you can explain why. <clears throat> uh, I wouldn't say there isn't free competition, but there is different networks to which each of these ports belong. And, and you these would actually say that these networks are traditional and that people would accept yes. price differences. It yes. was to stick to the network rather than change suppliers. Okay. It is harder to change suppliers. Um, I think, then is commonly assumed. Okay, yes, I take your point. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, yes. I just have a question for you, Professor Michelkins. Yes, um, I was wondering professor. to what extent we should read these, um, and as someone so excited this subject, please, as you can answer for dummies, um, to what extent should we read these numbers as changes in routes, and to what extent should we read these numbers as perhaps change in demand? I was kind of struck by the absolute plummeting of Indigo. I mean, is that because people are using it less? Can you talk a little bit about the kind of um, the uses to which these commodities are put in the places to which they're delivered? Uh, those are the, the two the different sides to, uh, to the numbers, basically. There's the quantities themselves, yeah, and they, um, they need to be interpreted. And I had little time to interpret the data that I presented today, uh, or at least little time to present the interpretation better. Um, the decline of indigo is limited to one, or is limited to Danzig and Stettin. So the role of Danzig and Stettin changed drastically between these two years that I compared. I wouldn't say that the decline of indigo was general, of course. It's, so the interpretation would be the role of Danzig and Stettin changed, rather than any, more than anything else. And the number is just a number. Yeah, that's, they, it's all about the interpretation, basically. Okay. Yeah, of course. Uh, well, my question, my limited experience uh, with, with trade is to show that um, on the overland trade, it's easier to evade taxes than in a in store. So, how do you estimate the possibility of that your data uh, regarding the trade with China uh, might be uh, well uh, not representing? Uh, well, just the, the point of Stensgard as well. And well, one point also: how do you, you, you mentioned it's difficult, but Kitaika appears in Polish source in the 16th century, and I wouldn't say it's Chinese. And of course, it's it suggests being of Chinese origin, but and the same with silk. So the, much of silk that was believed to be Chinese was probably Central Asian or, 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 or from, from Iran. Is it possible to, 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 to accommodate? Yeah. Which also suggests that the, 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 the community of merchants in, of Nezhin, which started in the 17th century, was mm -hmm. mostly composed of, of Greek merchants who were former Ottoman subjects. So yeah. mm -hmm. uh, if I were them, I would start from my experience in the Middle East and maybe then uh, shift to, to Eastern direction. So uh, is it exclusively the, 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 
the, the roads to China that you uh, were focusing on, or also Middle East and Central Asia? Uh, also Middle East and Central Asia, not in this paper, but more generally for the for the data that I have, it also include, includes uh, other routes as well. But tax evasion and uh, illicit trade, yes, of course, these are just rough estimates. Uh, they're just indications. The numbers are indications of a, a long-term trend, perhaps. And uh, um, having said that, of course, it's unfortunate to just pick two years and compare them with each other. I, I'm aware of that. Um, the long-term trend would be quite clear, though. Chinese textile production is the Chinese imports of textiles to Russia overland via Kyakta uh, disappears. After 1824, the decline starts and it's finished by around 1835, 36, a little later than the year that I picked. Because from that point onwards, you can see textiles being exported from Russia to China, not to conquer the entire Chinese market, but the northern part of it for which the production of Russian textiles was better suited. They were not good for the warmer climate zones of China in the south, which were taken over basically, or from where uh, Britain and France and others exported their textiles. So that is a change that you can see, but not on the basis of a single year. That is when you create long, long time series, you can see this change um, appearing, basically. And then the, the exact numbers are not that important anymore. But when we think about luxury consumption, like luxury seats, I would expect that the, the court, the Tsar's court, would be a huge consumer. And they probably didn't pay any taxes. So, so how do you evaluate this uh, consumption? Mm -hmm. Because when, when I studied 16th century trade between the Ottoman Empire and Poland Lithuania, mm -hmm. the largest merchants didn't pay any taxes. Mm -hmm. Because they were the so-called Hasati Jar, the, 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 the private merchants of the of the sultan and they, and, and they traded great money and and, yeah. uh, and silk and they didn't pay anything yes i agree uh, not paying taxes does not necessarily mean that it is not registered yeah. Yeah. those are two different things as well yeah. Yeah. and as far as the chinese uh, trade russo chinese trade is uh, concerned there is this clear indication what, uh, what um, about the taxes that were actually paid, and not everything was taxed. Mm -hmm. So that that is part of the of the state caravans at that time. That's earlier in the 18th century, of course. Yeah. Now everyone seems to be looking forward to having a cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. So yes. we are finishing. I think we had a very good start of the conference, and uh, I hope it would continue like this. <laughs>
some publications, uh, namely on Hermann Kelman's uh, well-known uh, former economic historian, deceased 20 years ago, something like this, yes. So. Uh, the second, sec, uh, the second paper will be from Samuel El Sarvend. Uh, it will be read by our co uh, by my colleague, uh, by my colleague. And uh, Samuel Wendt is a PhD candidate at uh, the European University <coughs> in Frankfurt or as well. And his title is, of his project is The Impact and Relevance of Tropical Cash Crops for Industrial Purposes in Wilhelmine, Germany, 1850 to 1920, that is moving far in the, 20s, uh, in the 19th century. And last but not least, we come to Klaus Weber. Uh, Klaus Weber from uh, has, holds uh, the chair of Comparative European Economic and Social History at the Euro European University of Adriana at Frankfurt Oder. Uh, he obtained his, long years ago, his PhD from Hamburg, has been for a longer stage in, uh, in a pro uh, project uh, entitled Jewish Philanthropy and Social Development in Europe in the 19th century, the case of uh, Rothschilds. He has been a, a research fellow in the Institute for, his, for the History of German Jews in Hamburg, and now he is professor in since many years uh, in Frankfurt Oder. Among his publications, uh, one should uh, underline uh, a, a German monograph, but very well received monograph, on German merchants in the transatlantic trade of Spanish America, uh, highlighting the connections between Hamburg, Bordeaux, we had this morning Bordeaux already, Hamburg, Bordeaux, and the port of Paris. In one of his might be interesting articles in this regional context. The context is a, is a recent article uh, on, with the title on spinning and weaving for the slave trade, proto-industry in 18th century Silesia. So this is the personal context of our speakers. And now we will start with Torsten Dos Santos, on Central Europe and the Portuguese, Spanish and French Atlantic from the 15th to the 19th century. Please. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I'd like to thank you all for the invitation to come. Um, my presentation today is based on a comparative approach between the relations between Central Europe and three major uh, European um, uh, Atlantic empires during the periods of the late 15th until the early 19th century. Um, as you well know, until more or less 30 years ago, comparative studies of the Atlantic empires was very uncommon. You either had books about the British Atlantic, the French Atlantic, Spanish, or sometimes even the Portuguese Atlantic. Um, and within this context, you would rarely read about Central Europe within these, either as a production center of uh, manufactured goods or as a receiver and consumer of uh, colonial goods. So um, I'd like to uh, introduce you to this comparative analysis between uh, these four players and their relations with uh, Central Europe. Um, for this case study, I've chosen four strategic uh, Atlantic seaports, namely Bordeaux, Nantes in France, Lisbon in Portugal, and Cadiz in Spain. Um, we're going to see above uh, the trade relations with Hamburg as one of Central Europe's major seaports, and three time periods, the 15th to 17th century, 17th to 18th, and the 18th to the 19th century. Um, 
Central Europe in this sense includes all the territories of the Holy Empire, meaning the Baltic Sea regions, going to uh, Switzerland, Austria, nowadays Germany, as well as uh, Poland, Czech Republic and Hungary. Uh, Switzerland, uh, just to note, uh, would be mean the Swiss Confederation, including also the principalities of Neuchâtel, a former Prussian principality. So, <clears throat> um, the Atlantic seaports, why I've chosen those, you will see very shortly now. Um, Nantes has uh, advanced to become um, uh, France's most important slave trade port during the um, 18th century. Bordeaux has become the <coughs> most important port of free exports to Northern and Central Europe. Lisbon, on the other hand, is the only city in this regard that was the capital and uh, the economic center of Portugal, the kingdom and the entire empire, or as Wallerstein would say, you know, the combination of um, uh, economic, political, and juridical power in one specific location. And Cadiz, on the other hand, uh, was since 1717 the seat of the Casa de Contratación, the Spanish institution for the transatlantic trade, but um, already since the early um, 16th century was part of the two monopoly trade ports of Spain with the transatlantic trade, Sevilla and Cadiz at the same time. Um, in our presentation, we will fit in how does Central Europe fit into the triangular trade. And this is not only by the means of commodity flows, but also by the means of merchant and merchant communities. Uh, as we are well aware, the transatlantic or the transatlantic economies were based on the Mara Clausum, or as the French would call it, the exclusive. Only the motherlands would have the right to direct shipping or the political and territory ownership of the land and the sea surrounding the colonies. Um, this, of course, leads to a no direct shipping between Central European ports like Amsterdam or Hamburg regarding, like, uh, for instance, Portuguese Angola or uh, slave trade Ivory Coast, uh, Brazil or the Caribbean. But um, as we will see during the 15th and then early 16th century, uh, the Spanish started with the Inquisition and the expulsion of the um, Jewish community. They went, of course, to, to Antwerp, and Antwerp became a, a refuge for these. Um, and there you would have then uh, one of the first parts of uh, kind of change and uh, transitioning between the economic elites in these countries. Because uh, in former times, the Sephardim, or the Jews, in other words, um, were uh, part or the major part of the socio-economic elites in Portugal and Spain. They had to leave uh, to Antwerp, but then they were replaced by another community, and these were Protestants, mainly Protestants, Northern and Central Europeans, in uh, a Catholic country. The same later on also happened in France with the um, persecution of the Huguenots. Um, then they were also uh, replaced by uh, Northern Central European um, Protestants. Uh, yes. During the 15th century and 16th century, you also have the point that um, Antwerp, that has used to be in the a uh, major European marketplace where everybody met and uh, did their trade uh, was attacked during the 80 years war and as a result of that we have a kind of diffuse bit towards Amsterdam and Antwerp and uh, not Antwerp, Hamburg which means that uh, from one single market spot and marketplace we go to several others even London later on um, or as the Germans would call it, an Entzerrung. This uh, process was also accompanied by, um, um, uh, by a retreat of the Iberian and the French uh, trading. This was a crown monopoly and crown trade towards a rather private central and northern European enterprise. And as you can see, 
you also have then the um, uh, change that the Dutch uh, become the new intermediary between uh, European trade, the inter inter European trade, rather than before the Hanseatic League, or we had more of a diversity of those. Mm -hmm. The 17th and 18th century, as Karl Rahn also Phillips also called it, was a period of um, stagnation. Of course, we have the 30 Years of War, we have other economic uh, crises, um, and we also have the ascent of the French Empire and the establishment of the French colonial empire. Before that happened, uh, we have to see that uh, Portugal and Brazil were the major suppliers and one of the only suppliers of sugar towards Hamburg and Amsterdam. These then, as I will show you later on by an example here of 1776, were replaced by the French. Um, as Paul Boutet and uh, Carla uh, Ron Phillips also showed, uh, we have a change and shift from the Iberian Peninsula rather to the north to the French uh, seaports and Bordeaux as well as a bit uh, lesser in importance Nantes became uh, the most important trading partners for Central Europe. Um, what that means during this time period is also that we have the contradiction of Nova Clausum and the uh, uh, supply of uh, Central European goods. This is just one example because um, Spanish and Portuguese uh, Atlantic empires were dependent on the constant supply of Central and Northern European uh, goods. This means not only textiles like platillus, um, these are fine and white Silesian linen. And as this graph shows you during the course of the uh, second half of the 18th century, uh, the blue line is um, the support from the north, uh, the French term including Hamburg, Bremen, Lübeck and the Hanseatic towns, excluding Denmark, Sweden uh, or Norway or other countries, Holland uh, in particular. Almost half of the support that afterwards went into the triangular trade to Guinea and uh, the slave trade came from uh, the Hanseatic, town, Hanseatic towns plus of course uh, from Silesia. But the French sources, this is directly taken from French uh, custom records, not from the Sunsol, uh, will not tell you the geographic origin. But as you can see directly here, and as we had in the wonderful discussion before, the point in 1760, I would like to point out quickly, uh, not only the Platillus trade in the east-west direction, also masts, copper, etc., went to uh, almost zero in Nantes, the sugar and coffee and cocoa uh, and cotton export towards the north also went almost to zero. In 1760 there was no trade between Hamburg and uh, Nantes, registered by the Nantes uh, offices. Then as you see later on it rises, but the importance of the north uh, uh, loss, uh, loses somehow. Yes, of course. Yes. Thank you, uh, Mr. North. Of course, 1776 is also the year of the American uh, independent Declaration of Independence. Uh, but 1776 uh, is also the year when the French uh, records of Nantes end, and Bordeaux as well. We don't have any records for the other periods, the 1780s. Plus, it's the only year we have reference with the Fra um, Portuguese records and the uh, Hamburg Admiralty the customs. So this is the only year that permits, for instance, a clear uh, contribution to do something like this, the sugar exports. The sugar exports um, from uh, Nantes, because I, unfortunately I do not have the Bordeaux data yet, but I will get that soon, um, and the Lisbon data on the sugar exports by their um, uh, natural uh, or local data, as you see here, the conversion to metric tons. And uh, at the lower part, as you will see, this is um, the total French uh, value on the market share in Hamburg, including Bordeaux, by the uh, Hamburg Admiralty Customs. And here the Portuguese share. As I said before, France had taken over the position as uh, the major supplier of sugar, 
uh, and Portugal was uh, only with 27% at that year. Still, the two combined are 90%. The rest are coming from um, England or even uh, some directly from North America. Um, who were these people behind the trade and who imported the sugar, for instance? Uh, in Hamburg at that time, it was rather the French Huguenots, and in lesser amount, the uh, former Portuguese Sephardim that uh, had to emigrate. On the other hand, who were the people that did the trade in um, the French and Portuguese or Spanish seaports were the German Protestants. Since more or less the 1680s, we have a rather continuous growth of these merchant communities. Um, data for the Portuguese uh, is quite rare. Only the recent study for 17th century Lisbon trade with Hamburg by Joron Pöttering showed insight into this. Um, for the time period between 1650 and 1755, data is probably <coughs> lost due to the Lisbon earthquake. For the other port cities, Nantes, Bordeaux and Cadiz, uh, Klaus Weber has shown great uh, research in how many Germans had been living there. And uh, I can tell you that, for instance, in Bordeaux, there had been around 225 Germans and German-speaking, including Swiss and Bohemians, uh, during the 1680s and uh, 1800s. Whilst in Lisbon, the data can only tell you after 1755 to 1830, there was something like 90. <clears throat> So we're coming to the next slide. What happened um, during the period shortly before the Revolutionary Wars in the second half of the 18th century? And uh, the 19th century, it's uh, very clear to see Mara Clausum due to the Revolutionary Wars as well as um, uh, the Le Exclusive with uh, the Revolutionary Wars uh, was no longer applicable with the loss of the colonies, the Atlantic seaports lost their importance as the intermediary between Northern and Central Europe, as Northern Europeans and Central Europeans could not do their direct trade with uh, the colonies. After this policy had to be abandoned, um, direct trade was uh, allowed and possible, so merchants went to other seaports like London, Amsterdam, Hamburg. Um, First, of course, the French Empire collapsed, as we know, in uh, 1789, followed by the revolt in Santo Domingue. Spain and Portugal very shortly benefited from this period, then both also had to decline, or felt into a decline. Um, Portugal had to open its uh, trade with Brazil in 1808 due to the help of the English for the, um, against the uh, Napoleonic invasion in Portugal. Spain had to face its uh, problems uh, in the Southern American countries. Just very quickly to uh, sum up, unfortunately, uh, I would like to show you the geographical origin of the German and German-speaking communities in Bordeaux and Lisbon as a comparative. You see the clear dominance of the Hanseatic towns and the northern parts, including uh, Danzig, Schettin, Baltics, and this card of uh, map they are unfortunately not included. Um, you also have quite a significant membership coming from Western German areas like Westphalia up to Duisburg or Wuppertal, by then Elberfeld, proto-industrial area zones, including not only textile uh, um, production and processing areas, but also weaponries like knives and uh, fire weapons. Uh, on this one, on the other hand, um, it is rather that you can see people also more coming from the south and Switzerland in particular. The Swiss merchant communities, just to sum up, in uh, Lisbon uh, were rather entrepreneurs and textile entrepreneurs that we also see in Nantes. They came with their knowledge and brought um, people, weavers, um, to produce uh, textiles for the slave trade, not only importing, but producing themselves, proto-manufactured uh, industrial areas, some up to 8,000 employees. 
And just one example how we can uh, identify these communities, because I rather wanted to show also a socio-economic rather than a statistical approach, the marriage uh, policies in these countries. In Bordeaux, Klaus Weber showed that um, during the 18th century, you can see 68 marriages of German and German-speaking merchants. 83 of them married local French women, or can also be uh, the daughters of uh, trade associates, and only uh, 17 married Germans and daughters of uh, trade associates. Whereas in Lisbon, we have a rather different pattern of the uh, 87 merchants that I have been analyzing so far, 38 didn't marry, 17 we don't know what happened, the documents do not show, and only 15 married Germans. The rest um, married Swiss or uh, English even, but it's not like um, a pattern that uh, a German would marry a German only or a, f or a French in order to gain access to the local society. Uh, as uh, it is said, this is um, part of my PhD pr uh, research project. I'm going to use uh, several data sets. Uh, the Sunto is one of them, local French data, local Portuguese data. So um, uh, excuse me if it, this is a working in process uh, presentation. And I thank you very much for your uh, listening to me. Central Europe to the Atlantic ports. I think the discussion should be at the end. And so I would like to ask Klaus Weber to read the paper of his colleagues. Okay, so I'm wearing the hat of Samuel Eleazar Wendt. Um, a brief introduction to the topic. In 1909, the uh, Colonial Economic Committee, Kolonialwirtschaftliches Komitee, one, Komitee, one of the leading colonial societies in Wilhelmine, Germany, published a report entitled Unsere Kolonialwirtschaft in ihrer Bedeutung für Industrie und Arbeiterschaft our colonial economy and its significance for industry and workers or workforce. Uh, the report aimed to inform about the significant increase of trade with the colonies and the importance of tropical raw materials for industrial manufacture, highlighting the economic interdependence between colonial trade and domestic labor and labor conditions. The report was dedicated to the most important raw materials and arranged these in descending order, reflecting the significance of each commodity for German industry. The first chapter of the report dealt with cotton, the most important trade good. It was not only the most important trade good in Britain, but also in Germany. By 1900, the German's cotton industry had become the largest on the European continent and the third largest in the world. The value of its output was the most considerable of all domestic industries and constituted the nation's most important export product. In 1902, Germany imported approximately half a million tons of cotton. The United States provided about 70 to 18 percent of this volume. India and Egypt were secondary suppliers. The second most important commodity was rubber, an indispensable raw material, increasingly indispensable during the 19th century. With the discovery of the vulcanization process in the 1830s, by which the product or the manufacture of durable rubber goods was made possible, the demand, sorry, I'm forgetting the slides. <laughs> Many thanks, this is the report. Um, 
Um, so with uh, vulcanization, it, only then it was possible to make really the rubber goods we know and demand exploded. And here too, Germany played a key role as its rubber industry grew to become the third largest too in the world by the 1890s. By 1910, it was importing 14,000 tons of natural rubber per year from Africa, Asia and South America. Oil, palm fruits and kernels are discussed in the third chapter of the report. The advancements, the technical or technological advancement in oil chemistry and oil seed milling improved extraction and processing, making palm oil and palm kernel oil appealing for a variety of product, products, such as soaps, lubricants, etc. By 1907, Germany was importing approximately 1,100 tons of palm oil and kernels per year. The uh, following uh, chapters of the report dealt with tropical timber and tanning agents such as mahogany, teakwood and uh, couch tree with mineral sources, steel and copper for example, with animal products like ivory, wool or ostrich feathers and with colonial edibles, bananas, pineapples and to conclude with stimulants such as coffee or cacao beans. Even though this report invites us to retrace the commodity chains of various raw materials of tropical origin, this paper will only focus on rubber and on palm oil. These two will serve as a showcase through which the spatial rearrangements, political and economic transformations of commercial networks leading to the reconfiguration of Germany's involvement in 19th century world trade can become visible. Following the abolition of the transatlantic slave trade in 1807, European merchants began to search for alter alternative product, products that would help to replace slaves as the commodity on African coast. And this quest for the legitimate commerce um, brought the, um, um, the alternatives of oil palm and kernels and later of rubber and other cash crops. When contemporary observers speak of legitimate commerce, they mean trade in anything other than slaves, including non-agricultural commodities such as gold or ivory. Alongside slaves, these commodities already had a long history in West African trade, which we can trace when looking at a map of the Gulf of Guinea, uh, here, particular stretches of the coastline, as you all know, will, were named according to these products, like the Grain Coast, the Gold Coast, the Ivory Coast, or the Slave Coast. In practice, legitimate commerce concentrated mainly on products obtained from commercial agriculture. Furthermore, contemporaries even conceived that West Africa could take the place of the Americas as supplier of tropical products to Europe with African labor retained and employed locally. Um, and this was very much linked with the idea of introducing the Christian and European idea of labor to uh, African societies, the idea of civilizing the peoples either religiously or later by colonial rule was linked to the idea of incorporating them into the world economy as producers and consumers. However, these processes were not uh, always top-down. Um, if you look at um, case studies, you can see that uh, African traders, African landowners, workers also uh, were very active and uh, had their own um, agency. For example, uh, Zimmermann and Beckert have shown that the Ewe people in Togo effectively uh, challenged the reform um, um, agenda imposed by German colonial rule. Um, these, uh, this ethnic group sought to dismantle, uh, the, the Germans sought to dismantle local textile production centers and to change the traditional cotton growing practices uh, in order to persuade and later on to force the Ewe to solely grow cotton for export. And uh, so that led to uh, um, uh, substantial resistance. 
and other uh, uh, examples could be provided. Besides um, cotton, a variety of crops, sisal, kapok, coffee, chocolate, rubber, were introduced from other geographical and um, climatological areas to Africa, and uh, plantations in Africa supplied large amounts of these commodities. We shall now shift to the perspective away from the products and towards the merchants involved in Africa and in the Americas in order to illustrate their political roles. Um, German merchants from the port city of Hamburg had established trade relations with West Africa already long before the abolition of the slave trade and um, they actively participated in this trade but by the beginning of the 19th century um, uh, their role uh, had already diminished and um, Hamburg traders began uh, to um, uh, already began to look for alternatives. Um, as barter trade, they too had already brought to Africa the usual barter commodities, textiles, weaponry, tobacco, glass beads, household effects, etc. Around 1840, the Hamburg uh, merchant and ship owner Adolf Jakob Herz established trade relations with the peoples of the Niger and Volta river basins. Like other Germans, um, um, later, he bartered cowries, these shells which are brought from the Indian Ocean and which serve as legal tender in many African regions. They were um, a um, sought-after commodity, and instead of uh, uh, purchasing these uh, cowrie shells from the Maldives Islands, he bought um, another uh, type of these cowrie shells which had less value but the German merchants managed to introduce this lower value cowrie shell also as an alternative commodity on the West African coast and this was one important channel through which German traders could establish themselves besides English, British etc. traders on um, the West African coast. Um, then, um, uh, as a result of the Crimean War in the 1850s, the supply of Russian tallow utilized or used in Western Europe for the manufacture of soap was interrupted and uh, even succumbed. And um, during this period, also, uh, overfishing in the whaling industry um, uh, pressed the merchants and industrialists to look for alternative products for whale oil and whale fat. And uh, this um, worked in favor of the uh, palm oil production in Africa. Um, and it uh, was used for um, many purposes in European industries. I have mentioned soap and um, uh, fats but and margarines. It was also used for perfumes, for candles, and even for the production of explosives. And uh, this increased the commercial value of these African regions and the resources there. <laughs> Um, when we look at the Americas, a different picture emerges. During the colonial period, uh, hamburgers had already established the before-mentioned uh, trade networks uh, via Spanish and Portuguese port cities and um, uh, operated often under Spanish, French or Portuguese flags. Um, and once the uh, Spanish Americas became independent with um, the um, wars of independence during the 1810s, relations with these independent republics and with um, Brazil were possible. And here too, agricultural cash crops uh, were the main staple. With um, the... Um, 
expansion into the Amazonas Basin, this region became one of the most important provider of rubber for Europe and North America, and uh, German traders were very much involved there. Um, the transnational networks of Hanseatic merchants were not only crucial in the process um, of defining the networks of Hamburg business and shipping, uh, they also were very important for configuring uh, policy in Wilhelmine, Germany. Um, and uh, even before the German Empire was unified in 1871, a small and influential group of merchants began to speak out in favor of a Prussian-led national navy um, capable of defending German commercial interests overseas, so way before 1871. Um, this um, Hanseatic commercial involvement in Africa was very much contested by other European powers, but with the unification of Germany, this policy really was pushed through. And uh, these um, lobby groups of which um, the before-mentioned report was produced were being formed mostly by merchants and industrialists, and the Alldeutscher Verband, the Pan-German League, was also very much um, entangled with these uh, initiatives. So nationalist ambitions and commercial imperial ambitions were uh, very much linked. Um, then these um, um, rather scientific institutions like um, uh, Botanischer Garten in Berlin or the Botanical Museum and Botanical Laboratory for um, Merchandise Knowledge, Laboratorium für Warenkunde, were established. A Botanische Zentralstelle für die Deutschen Kolonien was established and they created research gardens, Versuchsstationen, in um, African colonies to adopt imported and local plants to plantation use. Uh, but in the end, this quest for autarky was never successful. One of the reasons were simply um, infestations by... Um, um, Insects, pests, yeah. And the other reason was that uh, Britain and um, a Dutch um, 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 investors were much more successful in really building up large plantations. And uh, this led to a um, uh, bess in the prices of rubber and the relatively uh, expensive production of German rubber in German colonies could never uh, compete with this increasingly cheaper rubber coming in from uh, Dutch and British colonies. So uh, rubber from German colonies never covered more than about 20% of German demand. Nevertheless, this ideology of autarky was again taken up even during the Nazi period. So there is a continuation in this particular German view on tropical raw materials. Many thanks. And sorry for the other question. Um, yeah, actually, I want to pick up this term of the uh, spatial turn. 
Um, and uh, you are aware that um, um, I have, we have to change. And um, this new approach has been very much inspired by writings uh, like those of the French sociologist Henri Lefebvre, who died in 1991, or by the American uh, Edward Soja, uh, born 1950. They are figuring very prominently. But behind those um, modern authors, there are in the background uh, German scholars who had made uh, space a very important category during the 19th century. They are probably very much inspired by Romanticism, for example, by Gottfried, um, Johann Gottfried Herder and his emphasis on the particularity of each uh, culture, of each nation, which is in turn uh, um, very much shaped by um, uh, the geography and the geology of its homelands, consequently shaping agriculture, architecture, language, etc. And impregnated with such romanticist views was Karl Ritter, one of um, the pioneers in modern geography. Um, his interest was not so much in physical geography, but rather on the mutual um, influences between mankind and nature, or culture and the environment. This is actually quite a modern approach. And um, Ritter was also much interested in change over time, so in historical geography. And his ideas were modified in the course of the 19th century, notably by Friedrich Ratzel, a zoologist. And this background explains to some extent um, um, the influence of um, Charles Darwin uh, and also uh, their misinterpretations um, in Ratzel's um, writing. It has a very um, uh, social Darwinist approach. And Ratzel adopted biologists' concepts for the description and analysis of political entities. He compared the development of states with uh, that of um, organisms in uh, biology. For the expansion and shrinking of states and of their territory, he formulated a law of expanding spaces, ein Gesetz der wachsenden Räumen, and thus he provided the theoretical blueprint for the colonial and the naval policy of imperial Germany. Ratzel's ideas there, when then further adapted by the geographer Karl Haushofer, who made a military career from 1908 8 to 1910, the German Imperial Army had sent him to China and Japan, where he studied Japanese military and advised Japanese military as an artillery instructor. During the First World War, he rose to the rank of a general, and Haushofer was the one who coined the term geopolitik, which became important in um, Japanese military planning and which also became a key word in the expansionist discourse of Nazi Germany. <clears throat> like Ratzel, he adopted concepts from biology, most notoriously in the term Lebensraum, understood as the living space which one people may defend against competing peoples and nations. Haushofer also held important posts during the Third Reich, and we do not need to go into detail here. Um, uh, however, uh, Karl Schlügel concluded that such contamination in German scholarship had made the term Raum a taboo in uh, German um, scholarship after the war. And this brief detour was only meant to explain why uh, the following generation of German and Austrian historians um, put completely different emphasis uh, on their studies. They were interested in social history, um, the internal structures and developments of societies, or rather societal orders. And this might also help to explain why the French school of the Annal 
was not that much appreciated by these younger German scholars because space was very important in the French tradition, yeah? deriving from Prodel and people like him. Um, now, an example for the post-war disinterest in geography, we can, yeah, go there, thanks, um, uh, can be provided by the prominent and most commendable works on Central European proto-industries. Peter Kletis, Hans Medix, and Jürgen Schlumbo's collective book on industrialization before industrialization and further works by these people. We could also mention the book on proto-industries by Markus Czarman, an Austrian, and his uh, British colleague, Shilak Ogilvy. Um, now, the lack of geographical considerations or um, spatial approaches in these studies is even more surprising because the very object of their studies, proto-industries, could only exist because they depended on export markets, often very distant markets, but these markets, they hardly are mentioned in these studies. Um, and um, on um, the other hand, when we look at uh, studies on regions where these markets are located, mostly in the Atlantic sphere, so if we look at studies on, colon on the colonial Americas, or on the slave trade, these uh, scholars hardly read works on proto-industry. Yeah? So there were two regions which were um, hardly connected. Um, Now, we, of course, we can find some examples. Kellen Benz had been mentioned, or Manfred Kossock. Uh, Kellen Benz, a West German scholar. Uh, Kossock, an East German scholar. But they were not of this younger generation of Medic and uh, Schlumbohm, etc. They still considered space. Then Wallerstein has widely acknowledged the importance of wheat exports from uh, uh, Eastern European regions. And uh, Sigmund Palpach uh, looked at a wider range of commodities tried, traded between uh, East Central Europe and the Western Hemisphere. And Marion Malovist has also been mentioned, but he was hardly read in Western Europe. Um, but they were widely disconnected, these different fields of research. Now, if we look at the commodities which were traded between uh, um, Central Europe and the Atlantic world, the major export item was linen. Um, and um, even a more recent essay collection on the European linen industry, published in 2003, treats mostly British, Irish and North American aspects, Sweden and Belgium, maybe a little bit on 19th century Germany, but the omnipresent linen trade from German lands in the 17th and 18th century, they are completely omitted in this book. Uh, everybody looks at cotton. Yeah? It's like as if they were hypnotized by cotton. But um, in spite of the inscon, inscon, sorry, inscon, inscon, Conspicuousness. Is this correct? I'm trying to be very elaborate, but I can't um, speak it out. So it was a very modest product, but it was omnipresent. All the products uh, that uh, middle class, poorer people, rural people would use would be made of cotton in all over Europe. And um, um, this. Uh, European homegrown fiber was produced in all the regions where we have a uh, uh, moist climate, from uh, Brittany in France through Normandy, Flanders, Westphalia, Swabia, Bohemia, Silesia. These were classical proto-industrial regions. You have um, enough rainfall to grow the flax, yeah? and you have rural labor which is cheap to weave, uh, to spin and weave. And the product itself is very comfortable to wear in um, a hot climate. Uh, and it is four times more robust than cotton fibers. So it was an ideal textile for work wear. Um, and uh, already in the late medieval period, um, uh, 
Upper Germany or Oberdeutschland were exporting linen products as a mass export item trans on transalpine routes through Genoa and Venice into the, the Mediterranean basin. Um, and one of the um, macroeconomic tasks of this trade was to obtain bullion. They, some of um, a portion of these textiles were sold in Africa and traded against European silver to buy the very attractive trading goods from the Oriental world, from the Levant. So a basic pattern of uh, late medieval um, foreign trade from Central Europe was export of linen and also of brassware, copper products, to the south in order to obtain gold and expenditure of this gold for Oriental produce. Okay, so and um, these are um, um, uh, prominent trading houses which emerged from this world in the late medieval period into the 16th and 17th uh, centuries. Can we go one further? Um, and here you see the um, cities which were very important in this trade. And like later, Germans would be uh, present in Amsterdam or London or Bordeaux. At that period, they were present in Venice, Milan or Genoa. Um, this pattern changed um, uh, with the expansion of Atlantic trade in the 17th century, uh, which also brought about an expansion in the slave trade. Dutch, British, French colonial uh, empires would emerge. And um, this um, was essentially owed to the sugar revolution, the development of um, uh, sugar cultivation and processing and um, uh, production in the Caribbean and the rise in the demand for labor. Now newcomers from, uh, here you can see how this slave trade really rose only in the late 17th century. Yeah? So this is the change I'm not talking about. Then newcomers um, from Germany uh, would come from northwestern regions of the uh, Holy Roman Empire <coughs> and replace the older, older dynasties of the Fugger and Welser. Um, and you can now see the new urban centers and the regions from which the traders came to settle in Amsterdam or Bordeaux or Cadiz or London. Um, but so the pattern has now changed. We have now um, the export of um, uh, even a wider range of items into the Atlantic Basin, not so much into the Med Mediterranean Basin, and now it's for obtaining plantation products and silver. Yeah? Not anymore the gold from Africa, but um, with the new silver mining in the Americas, it's rather silver which is coming into Central Europe. But there is a large continuity of this link between uh, linen exportation and the plantation um, complex. For example, the Ravensburg Linen Trading Company, a small place uh, near Lake Constance in the south of Germany, had already invested in sugar production near Valencia in the 1420s, in the 1470s, in the medieval period. And only when uh, the Spanish and Portuguese opened sugar plantations on Madeira, on the Canary Islands, and then even on Hispaniola, uh, uh, Valencia in Spain was not competitive anymore, and the Ravensburg company sold their sugar estate there. But the Welser and Fugger would then invest into plantations on Las Palmas, on Hispaniola, and even in Brazil, already in the early 16th century. And the Welsa from Augsburg became one of the first important slave trading companies. They signed an asiento to provide um, Hispaniola in the 1520s with 4,000 slaves. The shipping was done by Portuguese, but the asiento holder was uh, the Welsa company in um, Augsburg. Then 
Um, this um, continues throughout the 16th century. Mark Haberlein, for example, he provided evidence for the continu continuation of brassware from Nuremberg being brought to uh, Africa. Um, in um, the uh, 1540s, the Portuguese crown and the Fugger signed a contract to purvey 7,500 weights, 7,500 hundred weights of brass bangles, 24,000 saucepans, 1,800 white bowls, 4,500 barber's basin, and 10,500 cold brooms to be delivered in the time span of four years and all explicitly meant for the Guinea trade. Yeah? So we can see that the Central European economy had through centuries been uh, closely involved with the slave trade. And uh, during the 18th century, German merchants and merchandise were prominent in the British and French slave trade. We can see um, um, two examples noch weiter, bitte, of the uh, cargo of um, the uh, British slaver mermaid. From 1732, we see that most of the textiles on board consisted of sletias, that's linen from Silesia. And uh, the French slave ship Amiral from the 1740s, there you see that most of the cargo was purchased in uh, Hamburg, again, mostly uh, consisting of linen. Um, now, um, which factors forwarded such a close integration of German lands with a continuity that was unhampered um, uh, from the 15th to the 19th centuries? Now we can look, have a closer look at the commodities. Um, linen and uh, second uh, ranked uh, metalwares, iron mongeries, tin sheets, arms and armor, anchors, etc. Um, and brassware. Um, next to textiles and metalware came glassware, prominently from Bohemia. Now, these products, they are either labor-intensive or they are energy-intensive, and many of them are both. Yeah? So, we can assume that it is cheap labor and that it is the ready availability of fuel, of energy, which worked in favor of Central Europe as the location to produce these things that were meant for export. And um, I think then we come back to geography. If we look at a map, that will very much help to explain this. Can, if we look at the European map, we see that all the important cordilleras, the important mountain ridges, are rather in the south of the continent. Yeah? So the water, the Wasserscheide, how do you call that? Yeah. It's far south. I mean, it's very easy. So all the water flows one way north. Yeah? And we have dependable, dependable rainfall through the years. Yeah? And then we have this wonderful European topography, rivers. There, each time there are probably 100 to 200 kilometers between the estuaries. Garonne, Loire, Seine, Rhine, Weser, uh, something else. Probably the Ems, I'm not sure. <laughs> so I, I bet you will not find such a topography anywhere else in the world. You have larger rivers like the Congo or the Mississippi or the Amazonas, but each of them has just one estuary. But here you have a dozen of rivers, so you have different estuaries, and this enables trade. Before the railway, rivers were the only reliable um, transportation throughout the year. Yeah? So it would be very easy to link the cheap labor region of Silesia, where the spinners were served, by the way, and as unfree labor, they produced the linen to buy unfree labor in Africa. They were really bad off. Yeah? This, a case study that um, Renate mentioned, which I have only been co-authoring. It's been Anka Steffen, another colleague working on our project, who really did the source work for it. So they were really in miserably, working miserable, at miserable conditions. 
You can easily link this with the Atlantic Basin, and already in the 1660s, a canal was built to link the River Oda with the River Elbe, so you didn't have to go there through the sound, and maybe it would be frozen up in winter. So you had a direct waterway from this deep hinterlands with the Atlantic Basin. The other factor that worked in favor of Europe was the um, um, early modern price revolution, yeah? that you have this decline of wages and prices from each to west. And when you look at the sources, all the uh, people in Western Europe are complaining. Yeah? In France, they are complaining, well, all the sugar uh, processing, the sugar refining is now done in Fiume, Trieste, and Hamburg. We can never get the fuel, the coal, as cheap as they can, and our workers are more expensive than those in Hamburg. Or there are complaints in Spain. Um, well, um, uh, it's a shame that um, we buy all our textiles from uh, Germany and that our own textile industries are in decline. Even our children are playing with toys made in Germany. And the um, textile manufacturer in Segovia is left with one single client, the king. So I think it would be um, fruitful in this context to look at maps, which was a weird thing to do in Germany for many years, and of course to have in the back of our mind other macroeconomic factors like the uh, <coughs> price revolution. Yeah. Many thanks. I just wanted to put some water in Klaus Weber's rivers. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> uh, I've just supervised a dissertation by a Japanese uh, scholar, Yuta uh, Kukuchi, and he could clearly show that rivers were only one option. And from Hamburg, Hamburg merchant decided whether they took the land uh, route mm -hmm. or the sea, uh, the sea route or the river route. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I agree with that. Yeah, I was sometimes surprised that um, uh, trading goods would be sent from Frankfurt to Hamburg yeah. Yeah? via land. You can't yeah. go there. Yeah, and uh, not via Amsterdam. So if there are a lot of tall, tall customs uh, yeah. stations on the route, you still had the the uh, option to to go via land. But still, I think that these. Um, uh, river, the, the, the waterways are very important yeah, for the grain trade, for example. And once you have established one um, trading connection with one product, you can feed other products into this network which is already existing and the grain trade was very important to establish but and especially Silesian textiles got always wet on the water that is why they have shipped them uh, on via land yeah mm -hmm. and, and land is more reliable than yeah. water yeah. depending depending we have at least two questions uh, following up on Ternow's comment there's a recent rather large book by Manfred Straube on the Saxonian Thuringian trade, and he also takes issue with those historians claiming that only rivers were yeah. important. He shows that the most active of the Leipzig fairs in the 16th century was the New Year's fair, where the goods were transported on the roads yeah. in the middle of winter, mm -hmm. while the Elbe, for example, yeah. was mm -hmm. really not navigable okay. at the mm -hmm. time. So yeah. I have, to look, I have to look at it. Yeah. Uh, I have yeah. two questions. Uh, one would be directed uh, Arnold, you had the two maps uh, juxtaposing the regions of, or the cities of origin of mm -hmm. the German merchants in uh, Bordeaux and Lisbon, and it seemed that on the Lisbon map the textile producing regions were 
largely absent, or at least less prominent, Silesia and the uh, northwest German textile uh, regions. Uh, was this impression correct, and is there a possible explanation for that? And the second question would be indeed directed to the whole uh, project. Um, is there a link between this sort of earlier narrative of the German merchants in the uh, Western European port cities from the late 17th to the early 19th century and this later narrative of the German merchants uh, active in the colonial trade in yeah. the mine yeah. period mm -hmm. or are these two largely mm -hmm. unconnected stories? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, no, it is totally correct why the Lisbon data does not show you the um, northwestern or uh, Westphalian or Silesian um, uh, textile producers in Lisbon because they did not exist. At least the church books existing of the German Protestant church in Lisbon do not show those. Uh, as well as the German Catholic Church in Lisbon do not show any indicator that uh, there was any motion from Danzig, Stettin or further to the east, so to say, uh, would have been living there at this time period. There is no indicator of any Westphalian or any. But on the contrary, we have, and that hasn't been uh, dealt in much literature yet, uh, we have quite a significant number of people coming from Neuchâtel the Swiss area of uh, cotton and linen uh, textile industries. Uh, so far I could get up to 15 in a very short period after the 1770s growing onwards. Um, yeah. But I wanted to show the merchants and merchants not only, there were entrepreneurs, merchants and a person could have several facets of its business and I only wanted to show the merchants. Um, textile producers, uh, again, um, in Lisbon, I couldn't see any of those. No. Yeah, I, I think there is a continuity in the trade as such, yeah? but in the minds of the people and in the political concepts, there is a complete change. Yeah? They, in the 18th century and far into the 19th century, they are really cosmopolitan. They don't care for national backgrounds. And in the process of nation building and the emergence of modern nationalist concepts, the traders are also affected. You can see that uh, with the outbreak of the uh, Franco-German War, 1871. In Bordeaux, the German traders are forced to make an option, become French citizens or leave the place. Yeah? In Hamburg, there are many Huguenots, the ones that Thorsten mentioned, who have been there for 200 years, since the 1680s, who had always been proud to be Hamburg Huguenots, who continued to use their first names Pierre, for example. And um, in 71, they convert from Calvinism to Lutheranism to show the whole town we are real Germans. And so th this is just an example, but you can see it also in their economic policies, in, in, in their lobbying. Yeah? They are rather now um, uh, pursuing uh, an aggressive um, way, asking for German colonial expansion before they would, um, in an osmotic way, um, establish themselves into foreign colonial empires. Yeah. So before, to use the um, um, juxtaposition by um, uh, Zombard, this essay he wrote during the First World War, Germans are Helden, not Händler. Yeah? Helden, keine Händler. Well, before they were really intelligent, they were merchants, yeah? but then they wanted to become heroes. And um, you could also put this in the context of these works by um, Charles Tilly and uh, Frederick Lane on the um, uh, links between uh, trade and the economic, fiscal and military policy of states. Because to build the empire and to defend it, that 
causes enormous costs. So into, far into the 19th century, I label it now German trade, could um, benefit from the existence of empires, but they didn't have to bear the costs. And in the second half of the 19th century, they somehow, yeah, there was a twist in mind and they wanted to have their own empire. Thank you very much. I actually have a question from each of the papers, but I'll roll the second one to the, the third if I could. Uh, for Torsten dos Santos, it also goes back to your final um, slide with the two maps. Yeah. And it was to ask if you could explain a little bit more about why there seems to be a dominance of Bremen traders working into Lisbon. I think 26 right. of the 95 years. Yeah. And I wanted, just as a follow-up to that, to ask about the impact of the shift from Berlin to Bremen, Bremen half, and then in the 1820s, 30s, whether there's an impact on Bremen's trade. Um, um, the yeah. second, or shall I ask all of them together? No, 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 sure. yeah? Yeah. And the second question was to do with counter voices to Hanseatic interest in Africa mm. in the late 19th century. Mm. And that brings me to a question directly to you, Klaus, and that is, your views of a counter narrative or uh, a different genealogy to the one you set out of Ritter, perhaps uh, going down to Hausen, mm -hmm. and that would be Savigny, Friedrich Karl, Karl Schmidt. Mm -hmm. And my point would be this that you set out a very interesting understanding of the space of how you're coming through from Ritter, that's a household that leads to geopolitics and all that that results with and the demonology and the phraseology after the Second World War. But there's a counter shift from Savigny and his impact. You mentioned the influence of Japanese thinkers in the 19th century. If you look at Japanese German trained jurists in the 19th century, who go on to become involved in the Japanese colonial enterprise in Taiwan and elsewhere, their understanding of space comes directly through this counter colonial Countercultural understanding of space, but space is legally defined. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder whether there's something there to do with a wider 19th century shift in an understanding of failure of religion, let's now call it culture in the 19th century, civilization in that kind of missionary way, as a way to control space, as the British realized in the 1830s in India. And so they shift from using Christianization to legalization, mm -hmm. with a clear distinction drawn between personal space, which is why it's possible for Muslims in India under British law to have three wives, but not in England, mm -hmm. and commercial space. And that's what we see emerging mm -hmm. in the German debates about colonialism mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. um, thank you very much for your wonderful question. Um, uh, and actually gives me the possibility to act uh, to add another little point to the Bremen merchants in this one. Uh, six of them actually married um, English women, and all of these six had been on their apprenticeship years in England before they went on to another marketplace in Europe. Cosmopolitan. Cosmopolitan, yes. And uh, the daughters of them were all daughters of former uh, um, associates. Um, Bremen is a quite interesting part of the Lisbon Central European trade because as Hamburg was the bigger player and absorbing all the merchandise, Bremen was rather the port of call for uh, sugar rather than Hamburg. Hamburg got loads of sugar but Bremen got another part of the trade and uh, coffee. Still today, Bremen is the major import of coffee in German rather than Hamburg. Um, on the opposite side, uh, I think that the Northwestern um, uh, German produced linen went through Bremen rather than through Hamburg. Because Pre Hamburg was the distribution center for Silesian linen, mm -hmm. and Bremen also because of the geography with the Ems River and other. Uh, yeah, the Weser. Uh, would rather be predestined to do this kind of trade. Um, unfortunately, the Portuguese data would call uh, Hamburg, but also implying uh, Bremen. So uh, there's no clear dis distinction between um, Hamburg or Bremen. But 
there are shipping indications that uh, can clearly say what Perman got and what Perman ends uh, sent to this one. Yeah. But this will be coming up in uh, the dissertation project. There will be a clear disti distinction between one and the other. Um, yeah. um, many thanks for this hint. I mean, the the, the genealogy I I gave it's my interpretation. Of course, you can also read that in some other textbooks. Yeah? And I have never looked at the discourse which was going on in the 19th century. Yeah? So this is really a good hint to look at it also from this perspective. But I could not give any comment on that. Yeah? Thank you. Well, I have a question to both of you. Well. Uh, 30 years ago, I wrote an MA on the textile import to uh, Central Europe in early 16th century, so my knowledge is a little bit outdated, but mm -hmm. what, what I do remember is that uh, according to the tax register of Kronstadt, Hermannstadt, of Brasov and Sibiu today, and also what we have after the Warsaw Uprising from the Polish tax register, uh, the most massively imported textile to Central Europe in the late 15th century, in the early 16th century, was not silk, not carpets, but something named Bogasia, and there was a strong argument that it was cotton, or cotton, cheap yeah. cotton textiles. Yeah. Yeah. And then it disappears. Yeah. We don't have, in Poland at least, we don't have anything about fashion, about consumer. Yeah. So my assumption was that it, this cotton was overtaken by uh, by, by, by Augsburg, by southern Germany centers, which produced all cotton. Yeah. But then again, we don't have anything about it. And I can provide you uh, with, with information about the Polish fashion, uh, with silks, all kind of materials, but not cotton. So cotton disappears in a way. So what happens with cotton production and cotton consumption in Germany between the 16th century and the 18th century, because in the 18th century you again you have, you have uh, this cotton even exported to, 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 to Africa, mm -hmm. to Habsburg. Mm -hmm. Is it, what, what about the dynamic yeah. of, of cotton? Uh, sorry, again, when, when is it declining, this, this current of cotton from, from the South From East? Poland it disappears in, the, in mid 16th century. Mid the, the, yeah. the, okay. the import from the uh, Middle East yeah. Uh, completely disappears. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think that in Transylvania it's, it's the same, but the best yeah. registers are from the late yeah. 15th century, so mm -hmm. then you have one in a hundred yeah. years. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. Many, many thanks to, to, that you refer to that, because I was thinking about including this Wolfgang Stroma. I don't know if you know this yeah. author. Yeah? I mean, he wrote yeah. a lot on the uh, cotton industry in Upper Germany. He said this was the first European yeah, cotton yeah, yeah. industry. Yeah? yeah, but it's 15th century, and, and then yeah, it disappears. Yeah, in yeah. Yeah. Also yeah, so Zygmunt, so Zygmunt Pach yeah. in Hungary mm -hmm. also. So the, the very uh, Fugger and Welser, they were also yeah. cotton industrialists. Yeah. And I have never, um, I, I didn't know that there was this decline in a discrete period of a few decades. Yeah? And I can only make an assumption <clears throat> that is, that in that period, um, cotton is coming in uh, uh, huge uh, quantities and at uh, cheaper prices directly from India. Uh, and it's too that, early. It's too no, early for okay. the century. So. Okay. I would, have, I would have assumed that it's importation of cotton either from India or already from early plantations in the new world, and that this substituted this import from the southeast. Since you mentioned Malovic, and I remember his more yeah. discussions about some tiny articles that he published in Polish, nobody read it, yeah. about the export of not even Silesia, but even the, the areas of Gross Poland, of the Wielkopolska region, yeah. to West Africa. It was so cheap, nobody wanted to, to use it in Europe, but it was uh, exported to West Africa, and we have almost no information about it. So is it possible that this cotton, that was not so popular in Europe, it was not as fashionable as later. This that it was immediately exported to Western Africa, and that's why it, it evades our cotton. Uh, cotton, cotton textiles. I mean, because the linen is is the local export, but we have also cotton which comes here, but it's not consumed. We don't see that it is consumed, or not 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 massively consumed. I mean, this, this book could be fast, uh, fastians, fastians, yeah. could be the mixture of linen and cotton. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, 
I would like to have uh, two questions, one question for each of the speakers. And the first for uh, Torsten Dos Santos about uh, German and German speaking veterans. You have the borders of today, 2016. Yes. So it is uh, not the Europe of then. No, the map is. Uh, no, no. Sorry, I couldn't find it. I see, I, see also, good. I see also the, uh, the uh, Villadrus from your university, the Adrina, the order. And you mentioned also the German speaking Bohemians, yes. Bohemian Americans, and Stettin. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mr. Skalchens talked about Stettin and Danzig. Did you look for German speaking merchants in Danzig? Yes. There were very many. Mm -hmm. Did you see them? Um, so the second question is for uh, Klaus Weber. And we talk here about uh, uh, textiles. Weber, Gerhard Hauptmann, Silesia. Is it so? I have learned that in this time there was always written made in Germany. Today we have always made in China. We don't want to see it. But everyone has it. Was it so? I have learned. Is it correct? That it was pushed by the English to show you are worse. You have to write, mm -hmm. it's not English, mm -hmm. it's made in Germany. Mm -hmm. Two questions. Thank you. Um, I could only show two, two maps due to the short time period. So I chose Bordeaux and Lisbon as the major ports. In Lisbon, I didn't find any person from Danzig for this mm -hmm. time period. And again, I have to admit, as I wrote at the time, it's only after 1755. The earthquake destroyed almost the entire city. And National Archives has only a few documents that are related to earlier periods. I hope to find one document in Bremen State Archives from a consul that was in Lisbon before. If not, well, then I can only live with the data I have, but there was no Danzig merchant or Gdansk merchant. That's um, but for the case of Nantes, I found one from Königsberg, and he married into one of the biggest families in uh, Nantes in the slave trading as well. Um, but that's just one example, unfortunately. Yes. Um, yeah, this is in fact the case that I don't exactly uh, remember which decade, probably in the 1860s, when a very liberal uh, European trading policy was in place that by law, German products, they could not no more be, um, they, you couldn't impose high duties on them, but by law, they needed this label made in Germany. And it was meant to let every consumer know that's German, that's no good. Yeah. But the, the German store, and then people realized, oh, it's not that bad. And Germans <laughs> made it the label we know. Made in Germany it must be good. Yeah. Uh, uh, made in China will be good in ten years. Yeah, it, it may well like be the case. I thought it was a It is not. Yeah. 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 Trade companies that uh, uh, export already exist. Well, the, 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 company big, the big companies, yeah. like the Compagnie des Andes. Yeah, yeah. Or, or even they, those who produce the Christmas uh, 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 of Mexico. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I personally did not come across, uh, I hardly came across any German who was at the same time member in these companies, but they exist. Uh, uh, in particular in Britain, there, uh, if you look at the work of Margaret schulte Beerbühl on the Germans in 18th century London, there are quite a lot of Germans who are members in the Company of Africa. The African Company, uh, they become directors of the East India Company. Um, there are heavy German investments into the Dutch East India Company and into the Dutch West India Company in the very first years of their existence. In 1620-something, uh, the Duke of Württemberg becomes one of the big shareholders of the West India Company. Or bankers in Frankfurt 
There are even German um, um, imperial officers who say we have to control all the correspondence between Frankfurt and the Netherlands because uh, they are all sending their gold to the Netherlands to invest it into their maritime companies. So they, they were, were heavy investment, but rather in the Dutch and British context, I would assume. Uh, and just in two sentences, well, in the Portuguese case, in the 1750s, early 1760s, there was um, uh, Felix von Oldenburg. Now, if you never heard of him, he had a great merchant uh, business. He owned the monopoly on importing tobacco into Portugal and redistributing it. And uh, David de Puri, he was from Swiss origin, he held the monopoly on importing uh, Brazil wood to produce this red uh, ink nowadays. So there has been this uh, huge uh, interconnections between interests, uh, political and uh, yeah, economic, economic interests. Yes. This, 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 this was the concluding remark, and I think thank you all, all of you for this. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I think David is really sure that this is adapted for Ladies and gentlemen, this afternoon we have three papers uh, dealing with non-nationals in colonial empires, two on Germans, or rather a German, in the employ of the Dutch East India Company, and the last paper on a, uh, what is it, uh, I think it, it's a Polish? Actually, he's from Slovak. <laughs> oh, he's Slovak. <laughs> <laughs> what is it, uh, individual in the French colonial? Uh, I think without further ado, I'll give the floor to Professor Leuke from Cologne, Professor of Dutch language, is that the... Literature. Literature, sorry. <laughs> uh, to talk about the circulation in spaces of knowledge between Asia and Europe, Rumphius Ambunis Rariteitenkamer, and it's po poetic knowledge. Professor Leuke. Thank you very much for introducing me, and I also want to thank the organizers of this Congress, especially people have for inviting me. Just a second. The following two papers, mine and the one by Esther Ahrens and Charlotte Kiesling, belong to a research pro uh, project that the three of us collaborate on. For this reason, I would like to start with a short introduction to that project. It is called uh, Circulation in Spaces of Knowledge between Asia and Europe, G. E. Rumphius and his texts, 1670 to 1755. Uh, the project, which is funded by the German Research Foundation, started in 2015 and will continue until 2018. Our project contributes to the history of knowledge in the context of the European colonial enterprise in Asia in the 17th and 18th centuries. The project is located in present-day Indonesia, an, area, uh, an area which was then known as Dutch East India. Within the broader context of the interaction between the Dutch East India Company's European officials and the indigenous population, we chose as an exemplary case study the VOC merchant Georg Eberhard Rumpfius and the texts he produced while stationed on the Moluccas. What we want to show is that the production of knowledge about nature overseas cannot be located exclusively in Europe. On the contrary, Rumpfius and his texts prove that the production and reception of knowledge about natural history is situated in cultural contact between Asian and European actors and that it is framed as a process of circulation with dynamics that constituted new spaces of knowledge between Europe and Asia. The working hypothesis that we have postulated says that within this productive third space, a 
hybridization of diverse forms of knowledge took place. Our analysis of the Ambonese Curiosity Cabinet and the six volumes of the Ambonese Herbal will hopefully prove this. The aims of our project are twofold. We want to describe and analyze the mediality and the materiality of those dynamic spaces of knowledge that have been cons constituted by Rumpius' texts and the context surrounding them. The two compendia are still in use as botanical and zoological references, and our project makes these compendia accessible from the perspective of, perspective of cultural studies. The Ambonese herbal was produced for an expert audience and is structured by systematic description, while the curiosity cabinet was assembled with collectors in mind and heavily relies on anecdotes. Therefore, we are able to compare and analyze a broad spectrum of methods and strategies for producing and presenting knowledge. Currently, we are focusing upon the curiosity cabinet. The historian and postdoc researcher Esther Ahrens is analyzing the circulation between European and Asian actors around Rumpius on the basis of a network in Latour's sense, following the exchange objects and written source materials. The PhD candidate Charlotte Kiesling and I are literary scholars in the field of Dutch literature. We are reconstructing the sources of the various knowledge inventories that were used. Empirical observation by the authors, Moluccan local knowledge, and European book knowledge. In the course of our research into the poetics of knowledge of the Curiosity Cabinet and its position within the genre tradition of European natural history, we will also examine whether traditional subject matter and narrative patterns are hybridized. For the first time, our project will merge findings from cultural studies as post-colonial history of knowledge in a joint publication and will additionally integrate early modern Dutch colonial history and its texts, illustrations, and objects into a wider European-Asian context. After this short introduction, to our project, I would like to turn to the subject of my presentation. The Ambonese Curiosity Cabinet is one of the first scientific works on crustaceans, mollusks, and mussels, as well as minerals and stones. The first edition, published in Amsterdam in 1705, consists of 340 folio pages of text and 60 full page illustrations. It contains 161 lemmata with descriptions of objects. The author of the book, the VOC merchant and natural researcher Georg Everhard Rumpfius, arrived in the Moluccas in 1645 and remained there until his death in 1702. Well, this is not a most ideal map, but you can see the Moluccas here and this very little spot is the island of Ambon, and uh, in my uh, examples also Celebes, uh, today Sulawesi, appears, and Makassar, a very important port at the time. So Rumpius arrived there in 1655 and remained there until his death in 1702. He lived on the island of Ambon, where he gathered an extensive collection of tropical shells, <coughs> crustaceans, and other natural objects with which the European curiosity cabinets of his time were stocked. He had connections with European collectors and sent them objects for their collections via the transportation network of his employer, the Dutch East India Company. The Ambonese Curiosity Cabinet not only bears witness to Rumpius' contact and cooperation with secretaries and draftsmen provided by the VOC, but also to his contact and cooper cooperation with local informants, as well as with naturalists and collectors of rarities in Asia and Europe. It is obvious that the circumstances in which the research for the book was carried out as well as the circumstances in which it was written and published were colonial settings. 
In my lecture, I want to address the question whether this colonial framework left traces in the book. With a few exemplary cases, mainly from the third book of the Curiosity Cabinet on minerals and stones, I want to show how the poetics of knowledge constituted by the Curiosity Cabinet is influenced by its colonial context. By poetics of knowledge, I mean a method analyzing the specific correlations between knowledge and manners of representation. In regard to the Curiosity Cabinet, I am interested in the rhetorical devices, such as metaphors and narrativity, that the text uses to present knowledge. Furthermore, I aim to examine the strategies that are applied in the text as a means of organizing knowledge. The knowledge production of the Curiosity Cabinet can mainly be ascribed to Rumphius. Most of the text consists of descriptions of reality from his point of view, based upon his own empirical findings, his rendering of local knowledge, on his education at a German Latin school and on his library consisting of canonized texts on natural history in the tradition of humanist scholarship from Pliny and Dioscorides to Conrad Gessner and Pierre Bellon, just to name a few. But his voice is not the only one to be heard in the text. The manuscript of the Curiosity Cabinet must have been completed around 1699 and it arrived in the Netherlands in 1701. Two Dutch collectors were directly involved in the book's publication. Romphius had sent the manuscript to Hendrik Dacke, a collector, physician, and mayor of Delft, who he obviously hoped could help him find a publisher. When Romphius died in 1702, the manuscript was passed on to the Amsterdam enterpriser and publisher François Helmer who in turn, during the printing preparations, was supported by the collector Simon Schreinfurt, a high-ranking public official of the city of Amsterdam. As Hallmark writes in his lengthy foreword to the Curiosity Cabinet, it was Schreinfurt who provided most of the illustrations of those objects of which the original manuscript did not give any depictions. Schreinfurt visited almost all collections in the Dutch Republic and had illustrations made. Moreover, he added remarks of his own to Rumpius's descriptions, which can be clearly identified because they were set in a dip different typeface. Thus, there are three narrators and agents of knowledge transfer to be considered in the text. I want to focus upon the way in which knowledge is transferred into the text and to the readers. Which information is selected? Which details are regarded as relevant? Which literary devices are applied to describe them? I am especially interested in identifying homogeneous levels of meaning created by the text. For this purpose, I work with the keywords wonder, trade, power and incorporation. According to Stephen Greenblatt, who in his book Marvelous Possessions has investigated the category of admiration with respect to expeditions of discovery in the Renaissance, wonder is the fundamental reaction of a person to a first encounter. He calls attention to the fact that, I quote, in the 16th century, the marvelous was principally theorized as a textual phenomenon, as it had been in antiquity." End of quote. Greenblatt refers to Aristotle, who in his Poetics closely connects wonder to pleasure as the end of poetry. Aristotle, quote, examines the strategies by which poets employ the marvelous to arouse wonder. End of quote. Christoph Hamann analyzed the travel reports on Mount Kilimanjaro, written by Hans Meyer, at the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century. Wonder turns out to be a functional element of these narratives, but it serves only one goal, subjugation. Hamann calls wonder the first link in a chain 
at the end of which stands appropriation. In the Ambanese Curiosity Cabinet, a similar strategy can be identified. Under the rhetorical varnish of admiration for newly discovered and rare objects, European supremacy and commercial interests come into view. Like colonial commodities transported to Europe, colonial knowledge is incorporated into the European body of knowledge about natural history. Wonder is of course expected to be a key concept of a book bearing the title Curiosity Cabinet and addressing itself to collectors of rarities. Rumpius often enhances his descriptions of objects with anecdotes that function as literary curiosities, meant to arouse wonder. For example, he tells about myths and magical practices of the local population. Moreover, he literally refers to wonder several times. In his description of agate stones with their great variety and characteristics but writes, I quote, so let us rather be amazed at the possibilities which nature affords and praise the wisdom of the creator and refrain from trying, trying to be too wise or from examining things which are beyond our understanding and be content if we can only guess at them, end of quote. Similar statements can be read elsewhere in the book when the author is confronted with, ob with objects remaining enigmatic to him. Even more prominent, such a religiously inspired amazement caused by the objects described and depicted in the Curiosity Cabinet is expressed in the framework of the text. The publisher, François Helma, opens his foreword in the manner of a sermon or a prayer, beginning with the words, Wunderbar is God in all seine Werken. God is miraculous in all his works. This cry of astonishment is almost literally repeated by the editor, Simon Schreinfurt, in his annotation of the description of the Caput Meduse. I quote, among all creatures, among all the creatures I have encountered, this must be the most amazing. It is an animal that should amaze the careful observer and make him say, Lord, how wondrous is your creation. I shall now return to the publisher Halma, who throughout his introduction and summary of the book establishes a poetics of wonder by using the word wonder and all its varieties as an adjective, verb or composition like wunderbar, wunderlich, verwundere, verwundering, wunderstücke, wunderwerke, no less than 26 times on six pages. <laughs> Among others, this is really wondrous. Among others, he quotes the beginning of Psalm 107. Those that go down to the sea in ships see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. He proceeds, and so Ewart Rumpius, man of great learning and perspicacity, was captured by the desire to produce an exact description of the animals and plants from the sea that can be found near Ambuina and other Moluccan islands and which he sent there from those regions to satisfy the curiosity of our fellows. End of quote. Thus, beside the poetics of wonder, Ham, uh, Halma establishes a scholarly poetics of knowledge, which indeed characterizes the style and approach of Rumpius' texts appropriately. In Rumpius' uh, descriptions, a scholarly uh, poetic prevails, following the principles of reliability, <coughs> completeness, persuasiveness, and re replicability, as Charlotte Kiesling has pointed out. Yet still, the colonial settings in which the text was written left their traces. Wonder is quickly followed by an appropriation of the admired objects and a taxation of their value as commodities. The second book of the Curiosity Cabinet on Shells closes with a chapter on how one should gather and clean shells. That's the title. Not only does Rumpius give practical advice to collectors, he also stresses the time and effort it takes to make an object look like a precious rarity. 
to those readers prone to the misconception that, I quote, it requires little more than picking them up, end of quote, Rumpfius makes clear that the shells sent from overseas are valuable, not only because they might be rare, but also because of the labor and skill invested in them. Information about worth and price is most frequent in the third book on minerals and stones, where such things are mentioned 22 times. The, opened, the opening chapter of the third book is dedicated to gold and entitled, I quote, how they falsify gold in these countries, thus immediately referring to the precious metal as a commodity. <coughs> Rumpius wants his information, quote, to serve as a warning to our countrymen who might be so fortunate as to have to deal with it, end of quote. He continues, quote, one does not have to fear any alchemical tricks from these dull natives, but they do have another cunning way with which they are able to deceive the experts in metals, end of quote. Here he applies the then common strategy of colonial othering towards the local population. They are depicted as inferior and deceitful. The hierarchy of power between the VOC and their officials on the one hand and the local population on the other hand is present in the descriptions of the object as they are sometimes made available by means of colonial power. In the article on the thunder shovels, which Rumpius thought to be engendered by the clouds during a thunderstorm, but which in fact are prehistoric tools, he writes about the difficulties in obtaining them from the locals, who would not give them away readily because they are attributed magical powers because they attributed magical powers to them. I quote, they are so infatuated by these things that one can only obtain them after much cajoling and a great deal of money or by means of open warfare. We particularly laid our hands on many of them after our glorious victory over the great Makassaris army in the year 1667 on Bhutan. End of quote. From his information and the annotations of Simon Schreinfurt, it becomes clear that thunder shovels are very precious curiosities sought after by European collectors. Repeatedly, Rumpius tells about the habit of the locals to carry shells and stones with them as talismans to become invulnerable in war. With malicious glee and a sense of superiority, he adds that all these allegedly protective objects do not work against the Dutch. These are only a few examples of trade and power as homogeneous levels of meaning in the curiosity cabinet. As the last keyword in the chain, beginning with wonder and ending with appropriation, I have chosen incorporation. Frequently, Rumpfius connects the new knowledge acquired by investigating nature and question, questioning local informants with traditional European book knowledge. His favorite authority is Pliny, to whose natural history Rumpfius regularly refers. He also contextualizes his findings by quoting contemporary scholarly sources from his library. Aside from that, there are also several examples of an incorporation of natural objects into European cultural tradition. In his description of a shell, which he called Zina tuberosa rufa, he tells about its use as a talisman by warriors on the east coast of Celebes. He does not believe in the magic effect of the shell, but he supposes that, supposes that it has a psychological effect. This makes them bold, we can read. This finding causes him to give this shell and another similar kind the metaphorical names of Ajax and Hector, heroes in the Trojan War. By giving them these names, name giving being a standard procedure of appropriation, he incorporates the shells and the practices connected with them into a European narrative of heroism. 
a peculiar example of incorporation is a list of so-called thunderstones on which specimens from East India and Europe are presented together. While Romeus mostly confines himself to describing objects from the Moluccas and their surroundings, his list of thunderstones contains specimens of various origin. The list is an integral part of his description of Seraunia, the thunderstone. He begins with two objects from his own collection that nowadays can be identified as prehistoric tools, also depicted on table 50. He continues with three further stones, probably meteorites, found on the Moluccas. The next items on the list are a stone thrown by a thunderbolt into a local church in the Dutch city of Grave, a stone that struck into a ship near Ceylon, and a thunderstone set in silver by its owner in the city of Goslar in Germany. After mentioning two more stones from the island Celebes, Pompeius quotes a printed letter of the German scholar Martin Zeiler, who mentions a stone found in a whale that was stranded in Pomerania. Next on the list is, uh, I quote, an enormous thunderstone that fell into Robert Pierce Field, end of quote, in Devonshire, England, in 1622. After having described three more stones from the Moluccas, Rumpfus concludes his list with the story of a ship sailing around the island of San Paolo in the Pacific in 1690, which was damaged by a thunderbolt that apparently left behind a stone. In this list, Rumpfus brings together all evidence of thunderstones available to him. He incorporates his Moluccan observations into the body of European knowledge concerning this phenomenon. Perhaps you remember that at the beginning of my presentation I introduced one of the working hypotheses of our project, saying that Rumpfus and his texts can be located in a third space of knowledge between Europe and Asia, a dynamic space where a hybridization of diverse forms of knowledge took place. The, case, the cases of incorporation that I just put forward seem to contradict that hypothesis because knowledge from Asia is incorporated into European knowledge. But is this the only way to interpret these cases? The metaphorical names of the Ajax and Hector shells originate from Greek antiquity, but the name giving is motivated by a practice of warriors on the island Celebes, although this is no longer visible at first sight. And what about that list of thunderstones that Bumpy put together? Is it just an assemblage of disparate information or does it constitute new knowledge, which is neither Asian nor European? As a textual strategy, a list creates coherence between its items without automatically implying sequence, causality, or hierarchy. Findings from Asian and European informants are put next to each other equally. A list is very well suited for the circulation of knowledge because it is open for deletion, addition, and the modification of its items. It thus offers a potential for hybridization. Further investigations in the poetics, into the poetics of knowledge of Rumpius's curiosity cabinet are necessary to analyze its strategies of colonial othering and of hybridization. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, especially for the fact that you kept to the time schedule so correctly. Um, we'll now turn to a second paper on the same uh, author, Rumpfius, by Esther Helena Ahrens and Charlotte Kiesling, and I think the two of them should what is decide between one another, uh, who speaks first? Yes, yes. we already. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, just waiting for the. Um, yes. <laughs> um, I have a. Thank you. Okay. It's 
Funktionsmodus. Das ist ein PDF. Das ist vielleicht. Ich glaube, das als PDF geht das okay. nicht. Dann, uh, hello and welcome also from Esther Helene Ahrens and me, Charlotte Kiesling, and thank you for having us. In the second half of the 17th century, Georg Eberhard Rumpf from Hanau in Germany found himself a permanent migrant on the Molken island of Amborn. First soldier, then merchant and natural scholar in the service of the Dutch East Indian Company, the Vereinigte Oost-Indische Company, VOC, he had married a local woman and chose not to return to Europe. After he had written a history of Amborn that focused on the political ecology ecology of the Moluccas during colonization, the VOC granted him time, books, and services to research wildlife in the region. Highly influential in contemporary European conchology and botany, Wimpsch's books also belong to the European literary canon of the Dutch East Indies, thus participating in colonial contact zones in different times and spaces. These contact zones have been defined by Mary Louise Pratt as, I quote, social spaces where cultures meet, clash, and grapple with each other, often in context of highly asymmetrical relations of power, such as colonialism and slavery, end quote. By means of a two case study, studies, we are going to analyze the specifics of knowledge production on Ambon and also the resulting col coloniality as it was transported in Wurmfjord's texts, which were widely circulated across Europe. The first case study by Hester Helena, Arend, Esther Helena Arends focuses on slave work as one foundation of knowledge production in colonial territories, connecting the human body and scientific objects. How did Wurmf refer to slaves, and how did they contribute material to his research? My case study focuses on locals as mediators of knowledge, specifically on exchanges that included asymmetrical trade-offs. How did Wimpf gather information from the local people and how exactly are these exchanges portrayed in his texts? Thanks, and just a preliminary remark from me regarding slavery. Um, the argument in our paper is not about numbers but about rhetorical, rhetorical figures or figurations and in that in the space of the European Republic of Letters. So, in the Ambonese Herbe, Rumpf described both, both the island as paradise and as paradise destroyed. The nutmeg and fruit trees on the small, small island of Pulau Ai are a delight to the eyes and a pleasure to stroll amongst, and they offer such a beautiful sight that the entire island seems to be one single garden. On Ambon, after 1670, the Dutch had used so much wood of the white tree for houses and ships with Rumpfius writes, the result that most of the forests around Victoria Castle have already been eradicated. The asymmetry of economic and military resources between the VOC and their often Central European soldiers and sailors and other local forces was not limited to the natural environment. In visual representations, such as the um, depiction of Banda by cartographer and watercolorist Finkbones, there was scarcely a trace of violence. And also, um, if you see the colored title page, which, uh, which was probably colored by uh, Sibylla Merian in Amsterdam, you can see that um, the specific time and place are removed and it's sort of set into a timeless antiquity here. In his texts, however, Rumpf was quite clear about the consequences of colonization on Banda. And I quote a longer piece, the nutmeg groves are no longer owned by the old inhabitants since they were driven out because of their numerous massacres of the Dutch nation, especially the massacre in May Anno 1609 of Admiral Peter Willem von Verhoeven, where after the parks were divided among the Dutch and Mestizo citizenry who have to maintain a large number of slaves, usually 40 to 50 of them, while the large parks can have as many as 80 to 100. The history of enslavement and slave trade in today's Indonesia and the Indian Ocean world has only recently gained more attention in the entangled fields of commemorative culture and historical research. Um, as Rajibai put it in an introduction to a um, more popular book, Da wird was Licht verricht, 
in 2015, no monument, no memorial day, no discussion. While Bai focused more on deconstructing the narrative of a supposedly benign colonialism in the Dutch East Indies, Matthias van Röschum in the same year concentrated on the economic and social structures of slavery within the Dutch East India Company. And there's a big conference co coming up on that too. And in his uh, 2016 actualization of the Swart book from Netherlands Overseas, the Black Book of the Dutch Overseas, Ewald Fanwirth points out one of the edited and widely available 17th century sources on the topic, Peter van Damme's beschreiving of the East India Company, description of the East Indian Company, with a manuscript published, uh, written around 1700. And at the same time that Van Damme penned the details of the slave trade between Cape Town and Batavia for the Heeren 17, the managers in Amsterdam, Rumpf described those who were forced to work for the VOC for an academic public in um, Orientalist and racist terms. And for me, it's interesting too, I, I give you another, one more time the um, image of Rumpfus, but also its actualization today in the Truppel Museum in Amsterdam. And it's very interesting that the figure of the um, sort of natural scholar as a hero endures and his practices of collecting endure until today. Um, other than these source I mentioned, the Beschreibinge, which were guarded from circulation well into the 19th century, the Ambony Survey was edited and published, as we <coughs> heard, the same for the Curiosity Cabinet, in a Dutch Latin version from the late 1730s onwards. Rumpf described, and I need to jump here, the, um, while the lazy natives of Ambon, the wild alpharese from the neighboring island of Siram, here in a representation in Valentine's, uh, out in New East India from 1724, and also uh, Rumpf described the robbers from Nova Guinea, and he says, they are strong, robust people, and on top of that, very ugly, since they have short, russet hair that sticks up straight, and they spread the lobes of their nostrils very wide, and they stick rings or pieces of wood through them, which only makes their natural ugliness even worse. The men from today's West Papua were in Rumpf alienated as uncivilized people. And this passage about the use of the small white sager or nitri as material for spares should be regarded in the context of a 1689 decision by the company that forbade the use of slaves from the western part of the Malay archipelago, which led to a dramatic increase in the demand for slaves from eastern Indonesia and New Guinea. Oh, sorry. This way. <laughs> and here you have a slide, um, the way Rumpf's work was imagined in the title page, from, in the copy from the manuscript, um, which was made in Batavia in the 1690s. Um, he being the textual person and the workers or slaves being the material persons. Um, in the Ambonese Herbal then, enslaved workers are encountered not as subjects, but as objects of observation. Rumpf's mostly referenced slaves in the users section writing more as an ethnographer, noting habits regarding food and health. The first almost casual mentioning of slaves can be found early on in the first book in a chapter on the coconut tree, which Rumpf has de designated to be the captain of the ship of his project. There he described ways to extract the oil from the fruit and notes that housekeepers prefer the Ambonese way because this gives them a lot of rodorobaban, which is the lower water with the dregs, like a thick and sweet syrup that the slaves like to eat with sugar and sagu. While Rumpf did not shy away from arguing details and categorizing information in the linguistic and reference section of the Lamata targeted at readers in Europe, he did not expand on questions of nutrition for slaves. In the entry on the blimming tree, for example, he adheres to a botanist's and businessman's perspective. And although these fruits are fine and large on Ceylon, they rarely reach perfection here for the slaves and common people pick them when they are not ripe yet. In the course of the books of the Ambonis Herbal, references to practices of slaves were explicit, while the ones to the practices of enslavement usually were implicit. For example, Rumpf wrote about the uses of tamarind. Sugared tamarind is really only for the apothecaries and was sent to Europe for that purpose in large pots and vats, being especially useful for marinas because it is a good laxative for people, cleans and thins the thick blood caused 
by the coarse and salty ships fair, and will protect them from scurvy, which is such a scourge, scourge to mariners." End of quote. And the flip side to this European perspective can be found in Peter von Damm's chapter on slavery, which includes a list from the year 1685 about the provisions <coughs> ships with 350 to 400 enslaved workers and, and, and what they should carry on board. And uh, Van Damme says, first 300 pounds tamarind for serving the sick and those plagued by scurvy. So um, science and trade are really commerce are really closely linked here. In a similar way, Rumpf did not acknowledge slaves as informants or contributors to his scientific project. He wrote about the slaves on Banda who were well trained to separate the maize from the nutmeg and were able to do this, quote, quite dexterously, but Rumpf did not comment on the value of craftsmanship and tacit knowledge for business, making his research possible, and he did not comment on the value for collecting information and objects either. An anecdote about a rare stone in the first book shows how findings are attributed by statues. There is another of wonders than riches, says Rumpfius, also from a um, coconut tree. This one had been found on Cylon in the wood of a calapis tree, which, after it had been struck by lightning, toppled over and split down the middle. The slaves of a Dutch officer who happened to be passing by went up to it in order to get the palmetto, and when they opened the top part of the trunk with their cleavers, they found this little stone embedded. Um, and they gave it to their master, who was a Dutch captain, a curious and trustworthy man, who later honored me with it. This quotation raises further questions about Rum's practice of compiling information and the scope of his own learning in relation to contributions by people he encountered. In 19th and 20th century biographical approaches, he is acknowledged as a linguist too, because the Ambonese herbal especially contains so many references to European as well as Asian languages. If 55 to 60 percent of the population of Kota Ambon, the city around the castle, in the 17th century consisted of enslaved people, and if Rumpf was in a privileged position as merchant and counselor, then he would have been able to quickly collect or extract this vocabulary. The same goes for geographical information. For example, he noted that the inhabitants of Madagascar also use tamarind daily in their food, for these trees grow there plenty and bear fruit twice a year. And throughout the herbal, he refers vaguely to plants brought from elsewhere. If he cannot attribute them to Spanish or Portuguese transports or transfers from Batavia. And by characterizing enslaved workers as superstitious, he robs them of any authority they might have had from experience and practice. And that's my um, last quotation now. The people from Halong tell a story of how a certain slave from their village found such a flower on Sairi Mountain, stuck it in his belt, and found that his strength had increased so much that he could carry a double load of wood until he came to a river, and while washing himself, he lost the flower and lost all his power again. And while slaves might have shared daily habits with the common people, as quoted above, in the colonial contact zone of the Moluccas, they were limited to carrying heavy material on their shoulders. Well, I understand. Uh, it's, it's, it's a okay. joint paper, and I'll come to the conclusion. And, so. you, and you continue? <laughs> yes, yeah, good, continue. good. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. So, uh, locals as the mediators of knowledge are the primary source of information in Rumpfius works, next to auctoritas and self-made empirical observations. The locals did not only provide information, but also the objects described in the Curiosity Cabinet. Like other 17th century scientific texts, the Curiosity Cabinet puts its truth claims for, from the authoritarian first-person narrator that is equated with the author Rumpf. When local knowledge is recounted, the informants are accredited by the first person narrator and are not inherent, er, inherently credible. The informants are also provided of a localization which confirms the knowledge is local and thus valid. I quote, one of my servants who was born in Lubu or Talabo, a province in the large curve of southern Celebs, told me, and so on. Information from officials of the Dutch East Indian Company and European travelers 
is also authorized by their position and the year of the observation as well as their names. I quote again, the first information came to me from Mr. Jakob von Weikerschlöd, former chief of Timor in the year 6081, and states the following. The locals are seldom mentioned by name. Exceptions are local people of position, like the chief of Timor, Raja Salomon. The compared, compared intimacy of Rumpf with um, him and other local people of a higher rank made Eric M. Beekmann conclude that Rumpf felt closer to the local population than to his compatriots and was able to learn exclusive information. I share Beekmann's opinion when it comes to the exclusive information <coughs> Rumpf was able to obtain. The local knowledge is often marked as secret, but is still told to Rumpf. But not all secret, secret knowledge is shared with Rumpf, what makes him reproach the locals for being secretive, too. So when it comes to Rumpf's relation to and recognition of the local population, I do want to point out this underlying reproach and negative depiction of the locals. Not all exchanges with, lo with the local population are portrayed as amicably and respectful as Beekman describes. When analyzing the exchanges with the locals in the curiosity cabinet, patern paternalism and exploitation are a characteristic ca characteristics too. I will focus on three examples of exchange exchanges that show asymmetrical trade-offs. All three examples of trade-offs come from the third book of the curiosity cabinet, that deals with stones, minerals, and fossils, as you have already heard. The locals use the stones, minerals, and fossils for medicine and see them closely connected to supernatural beliefs. In the curiosity cabinet, these beliefs are defamed as superstitions, as Beichlof. When reading the lemma on stones that happen to come from certain tree and fruit, the pattern Paternalism towards the locals becomes clear. Rumpf does not agree with the superstitions, and to counteract them, he takes the stones away. I quote, I knew full well that the pretense of these stones granting good luck was nonsense, nor did I see anything unusual or aware about those stones. But I took them off their hands in order to deliver those simple folk of the superstition, while I'm also well aware that in war, Victory does not come from such paltry stones. But I think it advisable to get such things out of the hands of the natives, because it will make them bold from time to time, which often causes them to wage war on us quite easily. By taking away these stones, um, Rumpf tries to free the locals from the superstitions by force. But his, motives, his, his motive is not to convert them. He has pr pragmatic reasons, knowing that the pure belief in supernatural powers granted by the stones make the locals watch war, wage war on the colonizers more easily. Maria Theresa Leuka called this a psychological effect. And that would be paid with money and lives. Rumpfius keeps the locals controlled by taking away the stones and leaving the locals without hopes on higher powers to assist them against the colonizers. In this example, one cannot even speak of an asymmetrical trade-off because, in fact, nothing was traded and um, it has to be seen as a deprivation. The report does not go into detail when it comes to how the stones were taken away. Did the locals object? Were voices raised and waged glances exchanged or other indicators of force visible? Was Rumpf, uh, Rumpf accom accompanied by somebody or was his mere social stand enough to take away the locals' belongings without causing uproar. The locals were used to their own hierarchy and had to hand over precious stones to their chiefs too. But did they acknowledge Rumpf as superior just like his own chiefs? Rumpf was, uh, was successful in the Dutch East Indian Company. Starting as a soldier, he changed into the branch of merchant and was promoted to the highest rank, a senior merchant, uh, but 57, the power of Rum's rank is notable in the Lemata on the stone Aprites. A man that had been put, put in, chains, in chains uh, handed the stone over to Rumphius because it would no longer work for him. And I quote, and knowing full well that he had been enchained for some trifles, I removed his chains. 
So each one of us went home quite content, I with his stone and he with his freedom." End quote. This story can be read two ways. On the one hand, the man may have been frustrated with the stone, not working in his favor anymore and giving it to him freely, who benevolently let the man be set free. On the other hand, one can sense force behind these actions. Rumpf may have promised this man his freedom in exchange with the stone, or maybe um, his rank was, was enough of giving the man the impression that it would be a good idea to hand over the stone. Either way, the story makes obvious that the locals were at the mercy of the colonizers. In the next and last example, the object, a precious stone formation, is traded in for money. To judge if this trade should be called asymmetric, the price is to be considered, as well as the interest of both parties in this object. The object is a coral rock in the shape, in the shape of, a, of a woman with half a body. The woman was identified as a drowned wife or sister of a Javanese skipper um, that the locals uh, reckoned to descend from. I quote, but I cleverly got that figure out of the hands by paying them one wig dollar, And it makes a fine show now in my garden. And afterwards, there grew, grew various small plants and flowers from the selfsame body, but because I had put seeds for them in the hollow little holes." End quote. The locals value the objects for its, for its supernatural powers and historical meaning. Rumpf, as collector, value only is values only its aesthetics. Maria Theresia Leuka makes this cultural difference a subject of discussion in her article on knowledge transfer and cultural appropriation. I quote, in return for payment, the native cult object can become a rarity in, Europe, in a European collection. Rumpf's description, Rumpf's descriptions contain an implied sense of his own cultural superiority. In the case of the stone formation mentioned above, the collection we speak of is not inside of a cabinet, but in Rumpf's garden. But how much was the decoration of his garden worth to Rumpf? In the curiosity cabinet, prices for natural objects and curiosities vary from one rix dollar up to 11,000 rix dollars for a piece of Ambra Grisea. The exchanges also work the other way around. In at last one lemma, objects are used to trade for slaves. One Rix dollar thus seems very little. Recapitulating, the exchanges with the locals in the curiosity cabinet have to be seen in the light of an underlying colonial force. The objects in the examples are traded for money or personal comforts or are simply taken away. The colonizers patronize the locals and exploit their knowledge and belongings. The power of the colonizers arises from the social rank, wealth and command. The actual execution of the trade-offs is inaccurately described in the Curiosity Cabinet, and much is left unsaid. The often secret local knowledge and the worshipped objects may have been easily gathered thanks to good relationships of Rumpf with the locals. But, as the examples show, the trade-offs are also asymmetrical and are characterized by force. Um, now coming to our conclusion, um, Rumpf recorded a social space that was characterized by processes of enslavement and devaluation, imprisonment and commodification. The process that Caroline Stolte has analyzed for Orientalist Dutch writings on India holds for Rumpf's text as well. As they were translated and reproduced, intact or broken up, and reassembled in new compilations, they gained a wider European audience. Information contained within the Curiosity Cabinet, as well as the herbal, was authorized both by the figure of Rumpfius as a natural scholar within the European Academy and by its materialization as printed book. And one might also add that Rumpfius had a collection of shells which he was forced to sell to Medici prints and which later supposedly ended up in Vienna. Um, other than information from handwritten archival sources, this form of colonial knowledge could be taken for stable and real beyond the social space of the VOC regime around 1700. Thus, 
the asymmetrical and forceful re relations with enslaved workers and local common people that are contained within the text could be reproduced in central European context zones such as libraries and academies. And um, thinking back to the first two panels with lots of statistics in them, um, so a project to sort of central Europeanize our study might be to look at more epistolary exchanges at the letters, at library catalogs and quotations to see how the um, how the this body of knowledge circulated to Göttingen or Gdansk, Danzig, for example. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, exactly on time, we now come to the third paper, sure. which, uh, <laughs> again, many thanks for keeping to the time schedule. The third paper on a, a foreigner in Madagascar. Yes. The floor is to Damien Tricuar. Thank you very much. I'm very um, grateful to be invited to here today and to have the opportunity to speak uh, to you. And not only, uh, as I heard uh, from uh, Miriam Fickerstein, because it's the International Day of Gratitude today, <laughs> but also because uh, this is a, um, a great opportunity to, to present some uh, reflections on a very special case a, a bit. Uh, this special case is, uh, has been uh, spoken of by Professor Chensky uh, this morning, mm -hmm. so Moritz uh, August Biniowski. Uh, it's very well known in Poland, and most Poles think that he was a Pole, but actually he wasn't. I must say, Mr. you come from Upper Hungary, so today is Slovakia. Uh, one goal of this conference is to check whether Central European actors in imperial domains had a special way of perceiving things of presenting themselves and of producing knowledge, um, a way that differed from those of the imperial elite coming from the center of the colonial empire. In my paper, I will concentrate on Maurice Bignowski, who was commissioned in 1772 by the French king to create a colony in northern Madagascar. The story of Bignowski is especially interesting in the sense that it represents the rare case of a central European who was in a leading position and had a great influence on colonial policy in the French Empire. Minovsky's life differed greatly uh, from that of other colonial administrators. He had fled Upper, uh, upper Hungary after having killed his uncle, uh, fought then in the war of the Confederation of Bar, was, he was taken prisoner by the Russians and deported to Kamchatka, and from this East Asian peninsula, he had fled to Macau in China and entered the service of the French king there. In Versailles, he was asked to create an establishment on Madagascar, uh, to develop peaceful relationships with indigenous elites and to commerce with the local population. Contrary to these inst instructions, Binyovsky tried to conquer the region, a tentative which ended in a disaster. In a disaster. In addition, Binyovsky was a confidence trickster. He made up wars and victories, claimed to have created roads and settlements, which in reality did not exist, and to have turned the Malagasy into proto-French people. Although his real life was adventurous enough, he presented fanciful narratives about his experiences and deeds, permanently self-fashioning himself in a very creative way. The case of Minovsky contrasts uh, with the way scholars usually write the history of uh, colonial knowledge in two ways. First, uh, the scholar has a tendency very much to underline the globalization of knowledge, uh, but what the case of um, French production about Madagascar show is that there are very distinct spaces of knowledge to be uh, observed. That is, there is a French Malagasy space of knowledge in the Indian Ocean, but this knowledge is not coming to France, uh, basically. What is coming to France is knowledge produced by people like Binyovsky, which is very different, as I will tell. And uh, second, there is uh, quite a concentration on the production of scientific uh, knowledge. Um, and this tendency uh, um, to concentrate on, on science history uh, has to do with broader patterns of interpretation, uh, namely the history of 
knowledge production in the colonial framework often postulates implicitly that imperial expansion and knowledge production had mutually reinforcing effects. Uh, there are some scholars recently uh, who are skeptical about this way of writing uh, the history of knowledge. I just want to quote here an article by Charles and Chini on the French case. Um, I think that it's very important to uh, look at different knowledge of the knowledge produce produced for the administration, uh, a knowledge which is not scientific but rather political, uh, and uh, that this knowledge uh, has much more to do with the history of colonial imaginaries uh, than uh, with the colonial, uh, with the history of science. So this paper seeks to answer to the question whether Binyovsky's um, upper Hungarian origins contributed to shape his policy and knowledge production that is to orientate it in a way different than the French colonizers. Did Benyovsky use se specific Central European interpretation patterns, or was he more influenced by French or generally Euro European worldviews? Did his marked tendency to fictionize his life was linked to his position as a foreigner in the French colonial empire? Or in other words, concentrating on the case of Benyovsky, do we learn more about Central Europe or rather something about the French Empire or more generally European culture. To understand, understand uh, Binyovsky's writing, is it, it is essential to look back at the French colonization attempt on Madagascar in the years preceding his arrival. Between 1660, 1769 and 1772, the French had tried to create a colony on Madagascar. Uh, <coughs> it was more precisely the Count of Modave, uh, who had tried to put into life an old establishment in southeast Madagascar, in Fort Dauphin. Modave was a former governor of Karaikal in India, and he had proposed Madagascar as a basis for a new French empire in the East Indies. This way, this was in some way uh, surprising because in the middle of the 18th century, Madagascar had acquired a very negative image in the French public sphere. This not, notwithstanding, in 1767, Modaf succeeded in winning the support of the Minister of the Navy for his colonization project. To reach, to reach this goal, he created a new positive image of the Great Island. He described this island as one of the richest parts of the, of the earth and the Malagasy as a people asking for French laws and religion. In his view, the Malagasy longed for civilization and order. For this reason, he argued, they would willingly accept French rule. This natural authority held by the French meant that a violent conquest would not be necessary, said Modave. It would be easy, he maintained, to turn the Malagasy into Frenchmen using the soft power of civilization. Modaf's assimilationist utopia resumed the French tradition of assimilation policy, of francisation, which had been implemented previously in Canada during the 17th century. At the same time, Modaf's argument uh, incorporated two concepts of mankind's progress. He, the new concepts that had emerged in the 1750s and 1760s. Modaf thought the Malagasy were destined as old men to adopt a European way of life and work. He championed the pleas of some uh, physiocrats for a civilizing policy towards the savages, so-called savages. And he was perhaps the very French, first French author to formulate explicitly the idea of a civilizing mission. Thus, Modaf's colonization plan resulted from a broad and abstract philosophical discourse. Modaf, uh, who arrived in September 1768 on Madagascar, was not successful, however. He proved politically important and isolated in the region. Trade was interrupted and diseases re re uh, ravaged uh, the French colonial establishment. In February 1771, his expansion project was abandoned and his principles considered unrealistic by the Ministry of the Navy. 
Nonetheless, after his arri arrival on Madagascar, just one, more or less one year later, Binyovsky soon claimed to have succeeded uh, in doing what Modav had intended, the establishment of French rule thanks to, the, to justice and to the prestige of civilization. Only five weeks after his arrival on, northeast, on the northeast Malagasy coast, um, Benyovsky wrote to the minister of the navy that he, had, that he had built a fort, houses, compounds, warehouses, fortifications, a pier, and wells. He also allegedly had drained the swamps around Rivour, and according to him, the regional indigenous chiefs had pledged a like, uh, allegiance to the French king. Five months later, Binyovsky recounted how he had established a new inland, inland, inland town. All the subjective chiefs and their peoples were enthusiastic about living under so soft and so just a rule, he wrote. One of Binyovsky's greatest achievements was allegedly the suppression, the suppression of infanticide. In 1775, Benyovsky declared that he had submitted the whole of North Madagascar to French rule without major fights. The subjective area was even supposed to include the powerful Sakalava kingdom of Buina, the most important port city of the northwest coast. Basically, Benyovsky told the story of a soft, humane and civilizing imperial expansion. He may have drawn inspiration from the numerous novels following Defoe's famous Robinson Crusoe. Benyovsky's narrative shared several characteristics with the Robinsonat. Citations from supposed documents and mentions of concrete places and names to create an effect of reality. The hero's lonely life on a distant island. The central role of the hero's efforts and suffering. And the building of civilization by a single man. The Rambassonat were marked by imperial and masculine fantasies. And, like Benyovsky, they blurred the distinction between fiction and report. Of course, Benyovsky's achievements were totally imaginary, as I said. And inspectors uh, revealed this in 1776. Benyovsky never built more than a few small wooden forts, which quickly deteriorated in the tropical climate. He led unspectacular little wars against local chiefs from the lesser branches of the Sakalava dynasty. His troops were hungry and ill, and the whole region was devastated. However, for a few years, Benyovsky's fanciful reports seemed credible to the French government. When the minister of the navy finally dispatched inspectors, it was not because he had any serious doubts about uh, the Benyovsky's accounts, but only to check if Northeast Madagascar was really salubrious enough to send settlers. Furthermore, even after his life had been discovered, Benyovsky was magnificently rewarded after his arrival in Versailles in May 1777. He receives a nurse, a great deal of money, and a great deal of money for his fairy tales. The decisions of the French government Government tell us that it appeared more important to reward a servant for, of the king who had sacrificed years and suffered a great uh, deal on a distant island than it was to judge whether the servant had given reli reliable intelligence about the places, peoples, and events under his command. How did Benyovsky appear credible for several years? First, his narratives were inspired to a large extent by Modaf. Basically, he narrativized Modav's discourse about self-colonial expansion through civilizing policy. For example, while Modav had announced he would put an end to the practice of infanticide, Binyovsky declared uh, that he had done so, and he made up a story showing how. I cannot tell every funny story here. Uh, <laughs> perhaps in the coffee, <laughs> with a coffee cup after that. <laughs> Vinyovsky was very creative in his narratives, but the fundamental cultural patterns he used were not specifically Central European. Rather, they had much to do with Enlightenment uh, in general, and in particular with the way some French authors, some so-called philosophes, wrote about Madagascar. 
The knowledge he produced was framed by the Enlightenment discourse about European superiority and was not influenced directly by his upper Hungarian origins. Nonetheless, it cannot be denied that, that uh, Minyovsky's discursive strategy may have been partly related to his position as a petty noble from another country in the French Empire. As a foreigner from rather humble origins who had fled his country, Benyovsky had no support through family networks. In order to draw attention to his person, he had to present himself as an extraordinary personality. As he and his family were almost totally unknown in France, he had the possibility to invent himself anew. On, this, uh, on his arrival in Macau, he had already developed a new version of his life story. He asserted to have been sent by Empress Maria Theresia to Poland in order to defend Catholicism against the Russian. On the whole, Benyovsky's discussive strategy was successful. He was soon considered as an unusual man, having gathered experience with the savage, as is written, uh, as the minister writes, and he was employed by the minister of the navy precisely for these reasons. Benyovsky's fanciful reports on his activities in Madagascar were thus a continuation of the only strategy he could follow to make a career in the French Empire. In the 18th century, the administration usually did not appoint foreigners to leading functions. Ministers chose people they knew or who were integrated into well-established patronage networks. However, Benyovsky's discursive strategy also soon showed its limits. Although the French commander of Ribourg of this colony of Madagascar was richly rewarded for his services, as I said, the French administration was not willing anymore to give him another leading position. Benyovsky thus strived to be employed by other imperial powers, especially Britain, but also by, funny enough, by uh, Austria. In London, he presented himself as a sovereign, as the sovereign of a Malagasy state that sought British protection. For this reason, he refashioned his narrative about his Madagascar years, although uh, it was already actually strongly fanciful, fanciful. For the British reading public, he wrote his memoirs, which soon became a bestseller across Europe, uh, being uh, translated in a major European uh, um, uh, languages. The memoirs differ in several ways from the narrative Binyovsky had written for the French Ministry of the Navy. He now portrayed himself as an independent actor who concluded treaties in his own name. He claimed that natives had named him a king of Madagascar, a king of the kings of Madagascar. Binyovsky described in great detail the impressive ceremonies consisting of a military parade, speeches, blood, oath, and homage, homages, and also of women dancing. He claimed to have been uh, to have introduced in the framework of these ceremonies a state constitution and to have created a government and laws. Benyovsky's narrative about his nomination to the dignity of a king of the kings of Madagascar was thus strongly influenced uh, by the natural law, law, natural law theories. As he explains how and why he became king, Benyovsky simultaneously describes the emergence of the Malagasy from a natural state and the creation of, of civil life through a social contract. Benyovsky's memoirs are therefore especially reminiscent of uh, Rousseau's vision. The Malagasy are a white people uh, in his memoir, which does not live in innocence anymore, but in a state of degeneration and anarchy. Recognizing their misery, however, the Malagasy elects a kind of Lycurgus, Benyovsky himself, to rule over them, uh, but with their consent. Thus, thus, the memoirs were not merely a document uh, meant to gain British patronage, but can also be read as a great example of the Enlightenment's colonial imaginary. Benyovsky failed to gain the support of the British government, however,
But he did succeed in convincing private men in London and in Baltimore to invest into a company that would use his position as a Malagasy king to facilitate, to facilitate slave trade. In October 1784, a ship left Baltimore with Benyovsky and 61 other persons on board <coughs> heading for Madagascar. In July 1785, Benyovsky and his companions tried to settle there, but were attacked by troops of the Sakalara king of Boina. They managed to flee and to attack a small trading post belonging to the French on the northeast coast, and Benyovsky, pretending to be a sovereign, began to build a village in the region which he had formerly ruled for the French, and so provoked the governor of the Muscarines, the French governor of the Muscarines, sent a military expedition to stop him. Benyovsky was killed in a French attack in 1786 and died a weapon in his hand as a self-nominated king of the kings of Madagascar. Even in, the last phase, in this last phase of his colonial career, the imaginary used by Benyovsky had not uh, been typical of Central Europe, we say. Uh, I cannot see a special identity or cultural influence coming from his uh, upper Hungarian origins. However, his marginal social position enabled, both enabled and forced, perhaps forced him to be especially creative and imaginative in order to make career. His cases give some insight into the mechanism of patronage, of knowledge production, of prestige production, and of decision making in the French Empire. And uh, I hope to have give you some ins insight uh, to it. And uh, I'm very curious to hear what you mean about that and how we can contextualize this case. Thank, Thank you very much. Well, we've now come to the last bit of our section, the uh, questions, and I suggest that perhaps we should first take questions regarding, regarding Rumpfius and then go on to the third speaker dealing with Madagascar. Who has any questions or remarks about the presentations regarding Rumpfius? There I see. Yes, go ahead. <coughs> I somehow immediately thought about stealing your research questions and putting it to the other two room things. So what does it matter like um, the position of room things himself? That he was born in Germany, did it play a role? That he was an outsider, or did it doesn't play a role? That he's a near company because of a company, so what yeah. Who would you like to ask? Uh, the, the question is whether, as a German boy, he would be regarded as an outsider by the colonial yeah. administration. But, um, thank you very much for that question. Um, I try to answer, the, answer that. I think um, if you look at the research and the statistics, the Dutch East India Company was Dutch by main, name, but had many, many. Um, employees, soldiers, and sailors from European countries, especially Germany. What might have been a bit more special was that he was, um, he made a career to merchant and even to the senior merchant, but um, <clears throat> he self-identified then with the Dutch, or with the East, Dutch East India Company as a commercial and military actor. So um, he wrote, um, a paper on the history of Ambon as well and, and the conflict with the other European actors on that stage. And then he always writes of our Dutch nation. So um, the, I think in the course of his career, the self-identification was then with the company and then as Dutch. So, um, I, don't, so I don't think it was a hindrance or um, an, an advantage, it was kind of neutral. Uh, okay. Even from his biographical mm. background, he was uh, obviously uh, half Dutch. He uh, came from Hassia, and uh, his mother seems to have been from a Dutch family. Uh, he wrote in Dutch, and his Dutch is, it's not <laughs> recognizable that it is German <laughs> writing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes, the second one. Um, I have two questions. The first is um, about the relation of the material of the object with the shell body okay, on a stone and its epistemological content. And if it's not, if this in this case of Rumpu, would it be uh, better to separate both? Because I have the feeling of what you have presented that um, the epistemological content, let's say the traditional native one, is not that much present in, in the description Rome they gives, uh, but he tries to establish a kind of European taxonomy of, uh, of the objects he gives in the description. So, this one observation, maybe I'm wrong and only rely on what you have presented. But if this wouldn't be a possibility to describe what, what is happening in, in, <coughs> in, in, in this um, 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 just a separation of the object and its epistemological content. And what do you mean by that? Sir? What do you mean by that? Uh, well, that, that is uh, the, the stones of the, uh, uh, um, the objects he collected um, or he describes um, have a different meaning um, in the cultures um, they, they were used, of course, than then the use they were made of in the European context. Mm -hmm. For example, in, in a um, taxon taxonomy in the nature of philosophy, uh, in, 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 in the nature of philosophy. Yes, but his description gives uh, both or the three. Uh, he, uh, what what we have left out here is that he describes uh, the objects and uh, where they can be found, and uh, uh, he. Uh, he gives a description, and then he really uh, creates a taxonomy and also a systematics and a typology and uh, uh, sorts and subsorts and so on. Uh, and then he he also uh, then he gives uh, also tells stories of uh, uh, indigenous uh, stories related with them or use uh, related with them. And then you have uh, the, the editor, Simon Schreinfurt, and he uh, uh, tells stories about in, in which collection he found an object, or uh, the bigger one it is in the Amsterdam cabinet of, and so forth. So that, that is uh, an addition by the, by the editor. So the, what, what European uh, collectors prefer. Is also added, but uh, all the elements that you uh, uh, summed up uh, are treated in uh, the book. So, then I have a second question: um, How much Malaysian terms he gives? Did how much he knew Malaysian? Well, he, he was married. Apparently, to, uh, did he really? Uh, no. Yeah. Did yeah. you really know this yes. yeah. it, it, Because what I'm asking is, in many cases, in other, in other um, documents of this time, um, often authors use um, the words, the mm -hmm. terminology, the um, foreign language, just to gain authenticity. So this is a strategy in the, in the quotations you get there, who was any foreign. Mm -hmm. Or maybe this, this was quite kind of by chance. But um, so, how much did he knew? How could he com communicate with and, and how is so then the knowledge geography also to be to be a wrong kind of um, the treatment of other rules? Uh, he knew uh, Malay and, and he also knew uh, Arabic script. It was written in Arabic script. Uh, we know that he uh, even used uh, a, a, a Malay manuscript for his history of Amal. He also wrote a history of Amal, so he could 
read it. And he gives each specimen also a, a Malay and an Amonese name. So every, uh, uh, he has names in 10 languages, that's the maximum, but the minimum is Latin, uh, Malay, or Amonese. Mm -hmm. And he also can explain the names. He says this means tooth, and uh, the, the, the indigenous population regards these stones as teeth from a magic bull or something like that. So um, you, you want to add something? Yeah. Um, perhaps um, <clears throat> to add to that, I, I think with Malay it's more than a strategy because as uh, Maria said with the translations and the explaining of terms and the way why they are named and it's connected to practices with the objects and he, he explains that in detail. Um, about the other languages, I'm not so sure because I think all the, sla the enslaved workers came from different places and, you know, it was easy to collect words. But then the t taxonomy, of, of course, it's sort of a pre linnean and proto-taxonomy he has in, in both his books. But he, because he's localized, he lived for 50 decades on Amber and he's very much localized too. And I think there's, a, if you read these texts, there's a sense of um, instability and ambivalence. What is sort of the useful or the right knowledge? So he does include that. Um, so it's sort of the, the direction of the knowledge is European because in the Abel he also says that this is my Ambonese which I now send to Europe. So it's targeted at the academy. But he also says I include all the anecdotes and the old wives tales and the myths because there might be something valuable in there. Thank you. I think uh, you were first actually. <laughs> <laughs> to the three speakers, I think uh, there is a moment where, uh, when, your, uh, when your papers connect, um, uh, I think, and this is this moment you, you've been talking about this uh, hybridization of um, knowledge here, it's a very interesting moment and uh, maybe I just uh, picked up something wrong, but uh, <clears throat> Uh, this quotation about the stones that are actually seeds. Am I right? No. Sorry. No. Yeah. Th no there's so there's, there's a coral rock. Stones? There's a coral rock, and he has a garden for experiment purposes as well. Yes. And he puts the coral into the garden uh, as decoration, but also he puts seeds into the rock, which then okay. grow. Yes. So yes. it's yeah. Okay. Because yeah. I was like yeah. curious about <laughs> so what was. <laughs> in the end, uh, but uh, the question is about uh, the natives who are offering stones as some kind of an exchange of, um, let's say, forces, yeah, some kind of a sympathetic or not sympathetic, but any, anyway, magical exchange, yeah? Uh, and uh, uh, so in this quotation, the other quotation, yeah, uh, he's trying to show that, um, uh, to excuse, yeah, his taking of the stones. Uh, somehow by reasoning that it's good to divide the natives of those stones because they can get a bit uh, courageous or with a bold. Yeah? But this is actually this moment of opening up to this uh, superstition that he wants to prevent, yeah? to the magic of it, because he's actually uh, is the kind of under the declaration of his is that, well, just in case, I'll take them. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. a very nice moment. Uh, of um, uh, kind of surrendering to this native knowledge mm -hmm. of sorts, yeah? Yeah, I think it's, that's a very good point, maybe, just to see, like, that he maybe did not said that he believed in it, but he did um, put all these, like, magical and ritual uses of the objects in his book. So he must have found it interesting or something. Because this would be that not only the uh, aesthetic objects, yeah? And there will be uh, something more than just aesthetic um, objects for collecting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a question over there. Uh, from Charlotte. Um, it's, it's really interesting to see the credit methodology. Who, who is getting credit and who is, does not? And, 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 okay. and do you have other examples that some people that gave him credit as informants? Because 
I've seen the chief of uh, the chief of uh, Timor, so he credited it, but but not a, a really not a regular citizen. So if you have another uh, another uh, examples, and for one of you, um, have you seen any improvement with his methodology within the times, within the decades? Something that you know that he wrote. In, in, in one of the decades, and then 30 years later, do you see an improvement with the methodology or something? Thank you. Um, do you want to take the first one? Sure. Um, I, I do not have uh, much more uh, quotations quote with me, but um, it's indeed uh, the case that he does not give the names of usual local informants, but he uh, does give the names of Rajas, like kings or regions of cities, and of a priest too. And it's only these uh, Raja, Zalom or Raja, Bimad is usually it's, um, the name um, contains where they come from, the place that they are the region of. And that's the only people I by now can say that uh, local names are. Um, but that's typical for the early modern period. You yeah. also find it in Europe. The gentlemen are always credited because. Uh, speaking the truth is embodied by the gentleman, so a common citizen you can never trust. <laughs> yeah, and that, that's, yes, that, that's what I said, that really the author uh, or, or the um, like woman in the text is, is the one who says that somebody is believable. So he says, I, I, I do believe him, and, and that has to do, if, if it's not a gentleman of somebody of rank. And a Raja is a gentleman and a priest as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, the, 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 yes. That was a, yes. I, I the second side yeah, to it. Is yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, about the improvement of the methodology, um, he collected materials throughout three or four decades, and he writes in the preface of the Ammonis Herbal as well that um, he sort of took the plants and the information as they came by in his daily life as a merchant and a counselor, and then. Um, his material burned and he turned blind, <laughs> sort of the heroic catastrophes. And then also, I think he turned from a texture to an oral culture and he was provided with illustrators and people who wrote for him. And I think in that sort of collaborative space, there was an order of things. And then of course, he did more experiments, he sent parts of manuscripts off and then he did more experiments, so they had an actuarium to it. And then, of course, with the Ammonis Herbal, it was translated into Latin. And um, I think in a contact zone of um, Burman and botanist and Linnaeus, probably. And uh, it would be nice to do some research on that, what that means for the method and the ordering, because it's 50 years between the manuscript and the print. There was a question over there. Yes, <laughs> yeah. please. Yes. Um, so, the, so the, the uttering of slaves, presumably scientists mm. by authority, but promoting hierarchy. And so I'm wondering if there are certain themes you see in the language to describe slaves to kind of justify their enslavement or their inferiority, and particularly given a society where there is, you know, where, where pre-racial biological racism, and particularly the, the Dutch, where there seems to be a little more uh, intermixing than certain other colonial powers, how 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 is that? How do you either comparing it to other Dutch East Indian literature, perhaps Dutch? literature that's going from the West Indies, where there's maybe a stronger racial hierarchy, kind of what, what sorts of tropes are being used? Are these common tropes used in other Dutch or contemporary literature that's coming out of the East Indies? Um, I'm starting to research those questions, so it's only tentative answers, and perhaps uh, Peter Emma can <laughs> better add to that. But um, um, the slaves were coming from very different places, from Madagascar, Mozambique, parts of India, Eastern Archipelago of, of Indonesia, and um, he doesn't hierarchize slaves. So he mentions the common people, that's the European soldiers and, slavers, uh, soldiers and sailors, and he mentions slaves, but he doesn't usually say where they come from. Um, and I think from the quotes you, could, you have seen, uh, I, I presented on the um, people from Seram and from New Guinea. You can tell that quite early on the, the color of skin and sort of the uh, hierarchy of uncivilizedness does play into it. And about the intermarriages, I think um, there's literature on, on Batavia and that the VOC allowed marriages, but I think 
those would have been more with uh, um, sort of um, local in, mm-hmm. in ethnic mm-hmm. Ambonese or Javanese or perhaps Chinese women, and also. Um, but there was a policy. Uh, there was a sort of allowance of intermarriages, but so also there was a policy that all those, these people had to stay behind in Cape Hope at the latest. So um, you can speculate that Rumphius uh, stayed in the Molokas because he couldn't take his family, perhaps. Mm-hmm. No, that's no, it's quite mm-hmm. obvious, yeah. yes. Uh, any questions directed to the third paper on Madagascar? Yes. Thank you, Thank you very much for bringing the point about the history of knowledge as opposed to the history of science. And uh, I appreciate the argument that you make that the history of knowledge should be divorced from normative judgments. Uh, in other words, let me paraphrase it, it doesn't really matter whether we believe that certain descriptions of reality are adequate, what matters to other people at the time to do that. Now, um, if I understand that. I'm not entirely convinced that Benioski's success falls into that category because um, um, there was a literary uh, genre of uh, memoirs and was tremendously popular and 18th century also was a century of literatures. There was a demand for that kind of literature. Uh, it's not entirely uh, relevant but I think people believe it to be true. So the question would be whether uh, his reports actually affected scientific discourses and whether his information about Madagascar would circulate further uh, beyond the bureaucracies. Uh, because from the bureaucracies, uh, we see that, yes, the reports were convincing for a while, but they were proved wrong and they didn't go any further. So what was the um, kind of wider uh, setting of that kind of knowledge and how and where it circulated? Thank you. Um, I think we, we have to, to, to make this just between the memoirs and, and the bureaucratic knowledge. Uh, actually, I'm mainly concerned with the bureaucratic knowledge, even if the memoirs are so interesting uh, to me. And uh, I think that we can describe this, of course, as, as knowledge, because it's what the French state sees, perceives the way how it perceives the world. And, uh, I think that here on this point, uh, Benyovsky, he was not alone, but uh, he and um, some other people, they just uh, created a special knowledge uh, on uh, Madagascar, uh, which was taken very seriously. Um, this knowledge was also actually um, uh, in very, very interference with the philosophical, so-called philosophical knowledge of this time. Um, uh, but of course, uh, um, yes, and this knowledge was also taken seriously. So there is a, 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 yeah, a collaboration between so-called philosoph and the, the French Ministry of the Navy uh, and uh, the actors on the periphery. They uh, just use this kind of images uh, in their strategy to position themselves, but then and, and they influence the politics, uh, the policies. Uh, uh, Yes, in return. Yeah. So, the, is it is your question? Yeah. But outside of the bureaucratic decisions, did, did it affect any uh, public uh, public scientific discourse, say encyclopedia or scientific works or like descri- geographical descriptions? Uh, yes, it it affects very much. Uh, I mean, it depends on what you mean scientific. But as I said, this philosophical discourse. Uh, which is meant well, to be a serious. Like, let's not use the anachronistic term, but natural history. On natural history, it's a rather different field. Uh, it's a, another field uh, of knowledge production. Uh, although the national historians are also involved into the production of this kind of knowledge I was speaking about, uh, which is a rather uh, ethnographic and political uh, knowledge. Um, and uh, Yes, uh, but there is, there is, of course, there is also this course on botany, uh, uh, which is rather independent uh, from that. Uh, yes? I've seen two more questions. Uh, well, I think we really have to cut off. You first, yes. 
uh, my line will be short. Um, I uh, thank you <laughs> for this very interesting presentation. And I, um, first, I looked up Wikipedia uh, when you were <laughs> talking about uh, Bronowski, just to sort out um, for myself, obviously, um, his, uh, uh, let's say, nationality, as we might call it, because um, uh, you are right, indeed, he was of this uh, Slovak, Hungarian, uh, even tracing his family roots. Yeah, origin at the same time he declared himself Polish in his diaries and even taking part in this Confederacja Warskos Declaration. So we're talking about this kind of um, uh, declarative uh, um, mm -hmm. aspect is also kind of important. Mm -hmm. But my question is, ha have you tried or have you thought about uh, or would, be, would it be possible, interesting to compare um, Two figures, Bunyowski and Jakubowski, yeah, who was also, um, let's say, um, an interesting figure, an aristocrat, uh, trading, as far as I remember, um, horses with the Ottoman Empire, bringing in and popularizing the Arab horses in Europe, for example. Uh, he also was, um, uh, I think, commissioned by the Tsar to go to uh, Central Asia to do a study, one of the first anthropological studies in um, populations, yeah? Uh, so his task was to provide knowledge yeah, about these uh, peoples to the expanding uh, Russian Empire. At the same time, he was writing in French, yeah? including this um, uh, well-known uh, Manuscript found in Saragossa, and as we know, the original in French has disappeared. <laughs> we only have the translations and so on and so forth. Not quite um, the same, but in some ways comparable um, uh, figures, yeah, in let's say um, producing uh, also common knowledge, among others, yeah, and also imagination, because here fantasy falls is a very important. Uh, factor in the writings, as far as, 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 as I can say. Yeah? Yeah, Would you like to comment or leave it at this? Um, no, well, yes, what I'd say about the Polish identity, that's true that he declared to be a Pole. Uh, because, of course, he didn't want to appear as a murderer <laughs> who just fled <laughs> from his own country. And uh, he said, fashioned himself as a kind of uh, a woman who fights for liberty and for Catholic religion. So he just identified with his Polish identity. Um, uh, yes. Uh, yes, with Jan Potocki, that's an interesting hint. Uh, uh, I, I've never thought about comparing both. I will think about it. Uh, thank you. You think you but said it separately, quite intensely, mm. right? But, um, I mean, this, uh, they are incorporated. Bednowski is an incorporation of uh, a figure in European imaginary of the adventurer, uh, which is a figure in, in 18th century literature mm -hmm. uh, very much. And, and he, he uh, all his efforts is to be this figure, is to be this personage, mm -hmm. to have this. And uh, per perhaps it's the same as Potoski, I'm not really sure. I have to speak about it after, I think. There's so time for one last quick question. I think you were the one, or would you like to? Oh, no, my, my question was, thank you. If, if there were any other cases you found, if you find this to be an issue of his marginal position, did you find comparable cases of other people involved in, in, uh, in a colonial position which acted in a similar way to Benyowski? Because of their marginal position, without having, mm -hmm. without this having to do anything with Central European origins and so on. Because mm -hmm. your conclusion seems to be that the Central Europeanness of Benjamin doesn't matter. What matters is his marginal position, mm -hmm. and there must have been other French mm -hmm. ethnic I mean, and this thing don't really matter in that case. Mm -hmm. you see what the room was earlier. But um, mm -hmm. were there other individuals who were influenced mm -hmm. in this? Uh, yes, there are, I mean, the archive is full of documents written by such people. Right. Uh, if you look at the memoirs, the, the French Ministry of the Navy had a special archive for, not memoirs, but for, uh, how say, yes, um, 
memoranda, uh, memoranda about other parts of the world, of the world. And uh, if you go at the historians, at first you go, oh, that's the knowledge of the administration. And actually, this, not, this memoranda were used by in the administration, but they were written mostly by marginal people, mm -hmm. uh, mostly by French marginal people. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, uh, uh, and Bignowski is quite an exception, as a foreigner. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, a lot of uh, French people tried to, to gain positions in the French Empire by uh, producing a memoranda which were meant to, to be taken seriously. Uh, uh, but with, if we analyze with the reality in Madagascar this, of this French Malagasy society which develops in, in the 18th century, uh, there is a total disconnection <laughs> between, between both uh, <laughs> spaces. So that's uh, quite an interesting phenomenon. I saw one desperate last question. Mm -hmm. It's short. <laughs> 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 very short. Two remarks. Uh, first one is who's really actually the report who's taking decisions. Because uh, unlike Bernard Bernard the first questions, you meant the French state. Certainly doesn't mean anything. So, I mean, there is a one step of translation still between the administration and the minister, uh, which probably you know, you know, it plays a role about this, uh, who is susceptible to this yes. kind of activity, uh, <laughs> the storytelling. The second short remark is, uh, what exactly is, I mean, what, what are you searching for about the specific Central European or Upper Hungarian thing? I mean, could you emphasize, I mean, the first sense you should see again? We have, uh, we have a lot of Polish Enlightenment marvelous storytellers, uh, and you, you can so you can find this as well. So I, I think you can find it. You know, we are we are well before the 19th century. So it's, it's I mean, it's socialized in the end of the 18th century, before the United Nations states, before the nationalities, and discourse, and so on. So I mean, what is this particular edge of his identity or searching for? Okay, uh, just uh, beginning with the second one. It's, it's just in the description of the conference. It's one question: if Central Europeans, through their backgrounds, have uh, other perception and so on. So I, I just took over this uh, this question from, from the conference. Um, the, to the, the first, uh, there are, uh, it's very easy. The the, the, the Benyovsky writes actually directly. Uh, to the commie of the uh, minister, so uh, the employees of the minister working for them, they receive the letter, they make some um, uh, proposition how to react on it, and the minister writes, uh, it's okay, I, I approve, I, I don't approve. <laughs> and there is another way, is the governor of the Mascarines reports also uh, on Benyovsky. So they have two sources of information, uh, basically. Uh, so uh, that's the French state. Is this, uh, yes, these five people in the Minister of the Navy, actually, basically. Well, thank you very much. We've come to the end of the session, but there is Ola who will. Yes, there is still so, yeah, yes. there is still some time uh, during the coffee break to finish uh, your talks. There Absolutely. will be plenty of time during the dinner that starts at 7 p.m. at Bernard's restaurant. But we have our photographer today, only today. And uh, let's have a group photo downstairs. You, you can leave your links here because tomorrow morning we are uh, meeting here also. So if you, if you want, you can leave the things. Continue coffee break, but first, uh, photo. <laughs>